present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud and Geraldine Jones in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is Nicholas Parson. Hello again and welcome once more to Just a Minute. The game, as a lot of you will probably remember, is a very simple one. I'm going to give these three members of the panel some unlikely subjects which they know nothing about and ask them to speak for just a minute without hesitation, without repetition and without deviation. And if any of the other two, either of the other two, I should say, think that they are guilty of one of these crimes, they may challenge by pressing a buzzer. And if I uphold their challenge, uh, they will gain a point. And if the challenge goes against them, the person who's speaking will gain a point. I think the rest of the game will become clear as we play it. So let us start straight off with the person who's played it a bit before and knows quite a lot about it, Clement Freud. The subject is learning to fly, Clement. Would you like to try and talk for just a minute, starting now? One would have thought that when you learn to fly, you need a plane, but this is utterly untrue. You need a blackboard and a man with a white shirt and gold stripes on his shoulders who has a pointer and draws... Uh, well, Williams I challenge you... that. I don't see what the men with gold rings has got to do with flying. I mean, it's <laughs> grace, it's deviation, isn't it? He was deviating. I could see him deviating. <laughs> eyes were deviating too. Kenneth, Definitely you deviating. are pressing your point very, very strongly. Thank you. But even though you're new to the show, I'm afraid I can't uphold it. I've seen men with rings round their arms connected with flying. In fact, all flying officers have got them. So I uphold uh, Clement Freud. <laughs> <laughs> you needn't great, look so shocked. You needn't look so shocked. I know you keep all your best expressions for radio, but... Uh, <laughs> Kevin Freud, you have another point. You have 45 seconds for learning to fly, starting now. Onto this blackboard, he draws things that look like fillets of place, but are, in fact, aeroplane wings, and he explains that pressure on these wings causes the plane to rise or lower. And after two or three days happily spent in a classroom, you approach for the first time the aeroplane which they are going to teach you to fly. The plane has to be inspected, so you walk round pulling at things, kicking at wheels, <laughs> making quite sure that the undercarriage is secure. Uh, Geraldine Jones, why do you challenge? Deviation. This is an inspection of an aeroplane, not, not a learning, not a lesson. A very clever challenge. You have gained yourself a point, a point, a point? <laughs> I don't give out many points, but for you, Geraldine, I would give a point. But actually, in the game, I can only give points, and you have gained one, and you also have the subject now with 14 seconds to go, learning to fly, starting now. I spent four very happy years learning to fly between the ages of five and nine. It was my ambition then not to fly by the base means of an aeroplane, but to fly by <coughs> spreading out my Clement wings. Clement Freud, you've challenged why? Repetition, four flies. The word... <laughs> Definitely four flies on Geraldine's speech. And, uh, <laughs> and before we go any further on that subject, Clement Freud, I give it the subject back to you of learning to fly with only three and a half seconds left, starting now. The teacher says, take this power lever in your left hand and grip the buzzer. Goes. And as the bell went, when Clement Freud was speaking, he gains another point. Geraldine, it's your turn to start a lovely subject for a lady, beans. Have a little thought about beans as you're new to the game and start talking for just a minute, if you can, now. I detest beans in any shape or form, though I have to confess that Clement Freud has never prepared them for me. He hasn't even as much as thrown an, uh, a recipe for them in a colour supplement. I think that beans are not only a tasteless and unappetising vegetable, they're a terribly confusing vegetable as well, because they come by lots and lots of different names. A cabbage is a cabbage is a cabbage, <laughs> but a... Uh, Clement Freud. <laughs> Repetition. <laughs> You do see when you play the game a bit, you spot them very quickly. Clement Freud, you've gained another point, and Geraldine, you appear to have challenged yourself. Uh, could you take your no, finger No, I, I just wanted to deny that it was repetition. It was necessary to the literary elusiveness of my style. Oh. <laughs> you can see that the audience are utterly with you, Geraldine, but I'm afraid, in fairness, I feel I must give it to Clement Freud who has another point, he has the subject, he has 38 seconds. Beans, Clement Freud starting now. Erico, flageolet, green and runner are the more common types of this vegetable to be found in the shops. 
during the year. But they also come in tomato sauce, in tins, heavily... Claire, Kenneth Williams. In hesitation. Yes, yes, in I hesitation. definitely agree, yes. And, uh, <laughs> can you discourse on beans for 23 seconds, starting now? I know very little about beans, the vegetable, but I must say I've had a lot of pleasure from watching those things that jump up and down. Men sell them in the street, you must have seen them. They jump up and down, they're very gaily coloured. <laughs> Geraldine Jones, why do you challenge? Repetition. Repetition, yes. What was repeated? Jump. <laughs> you repeated your little jumps up and down in the street, Kenneth. And it was almost becoming embarrassing, so we will continue. <laughs> With Geraldine Jones on beans, starting now. I particularly hate beans because as a small child, my name, which is Geraldine, used to be shortened to jelly and sometimes jelly bean. And as I was rather a round little girl, not to say fat, I used to... Clement Freud, you challenged. Deviation from the truth. She still is a round... <laughs> Do I uphold your challenge, or are you asking me to be ungallant and say that I agree? I refuse to be on this particular occasion. Geraldine, you've gained an extra point because you are not at that description of Clement Freud. So <laughs> you've gained one more point, and I'll tell you this. You have one second to continue the subject, so you might even get another, and you start now. Jelly beans are in Clement the... Freud, challenge again. Hesitation. Yeah. <laughs> She yes, didn't she hesitate. hesitate, Clement. She has a third point, and she has half a second to start in, in the beats. tradition. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> She's too keen now. She knows who's on sitting on her left. Uh, don't worry, I'll say now. Geraldine, half a second for beans, Be starting now. Beans are confusing. She can't do another point. Well, with uh, Clement Freud's ungallant challenges, uh, Geraldine has now taken the lead of six points. Clement Freud has four, and Kenneth has one. But, uh, Kenneth, it is your turn to begin, and here's something I'm sure you can talk to us at great length about. But just a minute will do. It is making friends, and you start now. I have made friends all over the place. <laughs> I really have. I've made friends on park benches, and I've made friends on ships. And I think that's a very interesting way to make a friend on a ship because then you get off the ship and you don't see them again, so you don't bored by them. <laughs> Otherwise, you tend to be rather bored if you overdo the friendship. At first, like everything else, it needs rationing, you understand? What is friendship, one might always ask oneself. Well, I mean, you could say it's taking the chaff and the grain together and sifting it all out and with a breath of kindness blowing the unpleasant things away. On the other hand, of course, some friendships can become, as I say, a great bore. And this is largely because you overdo it from the start. It should be rationed, you see. Friendship should be rationed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's back in the war, isn't yes. he? He's on with his rations. Yes. <laughs> You're not allowed to repeat anything. <laughs> yeah. Not well, as often as that. Not as often. <laughs> <laughs> not as often as that, as Clement said. No, uh, Clement Freud, you have the subject, you have a point. What is the subject? I'll give it to you in a second. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to give you too much help because you've played the game so often. You have 15 seconds for making friends starting now. Making friends with Kenneth Williams is a particularly rewarding occupation. You go up to him very quietly, preferably from the left-hand side, grip his fingers firmly in your hand and say, Dear Mr. Williams, I would like you... I challenged that. You repeated itself, didn't he? He said my name twice. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he called you Kenneth Williams and then Mr. Williams. He upgraded you. Oh. I have to listen this very carefully. This side you are. Clement Freud has another point and one second left for the subject, so he might get another one if he's clever. Making friends, Clement, starting now. Sir, I say to Kenneth Williams... So, Clement has just snatched the lead from Geraldine Jones and Kenneth Williams is still trading a little. There's no need to rub it in. <laughs> I've got to say what's in front of me. The listeners like to know. I said you were trailing a little. I didn't say what a little what you were trailing. You made it sound very derogatory, I think. <laughs> very devious. Clement Freud, it is your turn to begin. The subject is writing books. And I'd like you to try and talk for just a minute, starting now. Ideally, for this, you need a pen. But a pencil and a lot of paper will also suffice. You take the pen firmly in your right hand. 
Kenneth Williams, you buzzed twice. I didn't. I buzzed once. <laughs> came I think across... this lady here buzzed once. <laughs> I don't know what grounds. Well, what was your challenge, Kenneth? Oh, deviation. It's nothing to do with the subject at all. We take the pen in your hand. I mean, this is just commenting on something so obvious it's banal, isn't it? All I can say is, Kenneth, how would you start to write a book? (laughs) Your expression has answered me. I'm afraid Clement Freud has another point. (laughs) Has 50 seconds left for writing books starting now. Next, you need a plot, and ideally one which has a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> Kenneth, you challenge why? I challenge because it's, uh, it's entirely irrelevant. It's entirely untrue. You don't need a plot. <laughs> you could write. You could write without a plot. You could write a, a whole ream of stuff without a plot. Why do you challenge? Many it? modern playwrights prove it. Aren't they? <laughs> I will give you a bonus point for a very clever try, but I don't think within the context of the game it's a justified challenge, so the subject is still with Clement Freud, starting now. Books, when they're written, ought to look impressive, so that when you go about starting the whole object, you want to put words neatly together, phrase up... uh, Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. I would say so, yes. I think he was beginning to hesitate a little way back. He has a very clever trick of running his delivery down as he... <laughs> anyway, 25 seconds, Geraldine, you have the, an extra point, you have the subject with you, writing books starting now. Writing books is really an alternative phrase for being on the dole or unemployed. People who say they're writing books are usually writing books because they have... Clement Freud. She's written three books. <laughs> I hate to take it away from you, Geraldine, but Clement Freud, you have another point. You have the subject. You have 16 seconds, and you start now. Perhaps the most important thing is to find a publisher, because otherwise writing a book becomes entirely pointless as a venture. The man... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Hesitation. <laughs> yes, Hesitation think... after the word venture. It was a long hesitation. Yeah. You haven't spoken for a long time, have you, Kenneth? No, exactly, <laughs> yes. I asserted myself. Yes. 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 I mean, you going on about me trailing behind? (laughs) Well, let's hope you won't trail (laughs) so much now. And uh, (laughs) writing books, Kenneth, have you thought about the subject having asserted yourself? I have. Right. Well, you have eight seconds and you start now. I have written every day of my life for the last 15 years. I venture to suggest that it might make an interesting book. I don't know, mind you, whether anyone would dare. No, the bell went before the challenge, and so that means you have an extra point. Oh, yes. That's right. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Kenneth isn't trailing quite so much behind now. He is uh, catching up Geraldine Jones, who is a little way behind Clement Freud. <laughs> and the next subject is with Geraldine Jones. It's your turn to begin, Geraldine. Uh, ah, a nice subject for... A pretty girl. Lipstick, but buying lipstick. That's the subject. And you begin now. The gentlemen players of this game, if such there be, may look upon buying a lipstick as a fairly humdrum affair. I can assure them, however, that it is the most agonising ordeal because it involves going into a large department store, going up to the great dragon at the cosmetics counter and facing her and saying, I'd like to buy a lipstick. She immediately turns upon me and blinks a well-made-up eyelid at me and says, what sort of lipstick would you like? And I say, well, I thought the one I had on. And she says, oh, is Madam wearing a lipstick today? (laughs) Clement Freud. Hesitation. Yes, I thought you were going to challenge on something else. We've had four lipsticks, you know. But still, there was a slight hesitation, Clement. I thought it was lovely. I was all worked (laughs) out. I was getting all worked out. Oh, lovely, I thought. Well, Clement Freud, the subject is with you. There are 29 seconds left for you to talk about buying a lipstick. It should Starting be said now. straight away that the embarrassment suffered by Miss Jones when buying a lipstick is as nothing to mine when confronted by the dragon opposite the cosmetics counter when I ask for a petunia red because it goes with the colour of my eyes. Uh, Kenneth Williams. I challenge that. Why? Why? Well, his eyes obviously don't go with petunia red. <laughs> so why do you challenge? So it's inaccurate, it's dishonest, it's deviation. It's deviation, that's the word I was saying. Yes, I'm sorry, I meant to come round, I was coming round. (laughs) 
<laughs> His petunia eyes, you feel a devious. So, uh, Kenneth, you have an extra point. You have the subject. There are 12 seconds left for you to talk about buying a lipstick starting now. I buy a lipstick very often, especially in the winter. It's not a coloured one, I admit, but it is stuff that you put on your lips and it stops the wind cracking them. Because if the lips crack open and you bleed, it's awful when you smile. Because you go, hello, and it all blows. <laughs> Geraldine, I'm afraid the bell went before your challenge, so Kenneth has another point. He has uh, almost caught you up, but Clement Freud is still definitely in the lead. Kenneth Williams, it is your turn to begin this time. Nice. <laughs> Something perhaps you've got some personal experience about? The bank manager. <laughs> I'm giving you a time to think about it, because you're new, and if you'd like to talk for just a minute, starting now. I went to see the bank manager recently about this business of tax reserve certificates because I said to him, I don't want to have the money there earning interest. I've got to pay interest on a gain, do I? I'll buy these certificates and I get 3.5% and it's tax free, isn't it? And he said, yes, that's absolutely true. And I said, well, that's marvellous because with that money I could do with a new suite because I could. The springs of my chairs are coming right through. It's not very comfortable to sit on. So I went along and asked about this and he said, yes, you could. And I said, well, the money will be useful to me afterwards. And he said, but wait a minute, you can't use it. I said, what? <laughs> he said, no, the interest you earn has to go to pay more tax another year. I was furious. <laughs> but I think the whole thing's a great con, don't you? I mean, they say tax-free. You think naturally you can keep it, don't you, the earnings? And you can't keep it at all, because it turns out they put it aside and use it for another... Uh, <laughs> Why do you chant? He's deviated from the bank manager. He is a long, long time ago, I would say. <laughs> but you're absolute right. I, I deny that. I deny that. It's you absolutely will? cogent. It's yeah, cogent yeah, yes, to it my is. point. And if you go the on much manager. longer, you'll probably make the audience laugh again. Oh, no. again. <laughs> I'm trying but to I'm play. Still, I'm trying to play. I'm a sincere person, Nicholas. I'm trying to play sincerely. <laughs> You've been very sincere, I mean, but you also. She played a fraudulent also... trick there. She played a fraudulent trick on me. Mr. <laughs> Williams, you may be very sincere, but Geraldine's gained a point. She's gained the subject. She has nine seconds for the bank manager starting now. I have a perfectly super relationship with my bank manager, which is. <laughs> <laughs> That's indecent. We're not. <laughs> No need for filth, I guess. <laughs> All right, what do you challenge on? The subject, what, what of the three things? It's deviation, yes, of course. Yes. Worst kind of deviation. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Kenneth, I think it is probably justified within the rules of the game, what Geraldine just said. But as it was a clever challenge, I will give you a bonus point. All right? Yes, thank you. But Geraldine still has the subject. Oh, she's still yes. Yeah. And she has six seconds left for the bank manager starting now. It's based on the totally erroneous assumption by him that one of these days I'm going to make an enormous Clement amount... Clement Freud. By deviation. Your Why? Four seconds without any mention of the subject. Brilliant. Yes. Yes. Brilliant. It's true. Yes. It's true. <laughs> If she'd mentioned the subject, you'd have had it for repetition. <laughs> no, I'm still with Geraldine Jones, who has another point. She has two seconds left for the bank manager, and she starts now. The bank manager thinks that I'm going to make an enormous amount of money. Hello. <laughs> Geraldine, you're only one point behind Clement Freud now, and Kenneth Williams is four points behind Clement Freud. So you've taken out a cigarette. You're getting a bit tense, aren't you? Oh, yes. <laughs> Oh. Drop in here, I really <laughs> Clement Freud, it is your turn to begin. The subject is traffic jams. Can you speak for just a minute, please, starting now? A traffic jam is generally caused by a lot of cars and a shortage of road. <laughs> this you can see particularly in the early mornings or the late evenings in the metropolitan rather than urban areas of this country. A particularly unpleasant traffic jam in which I once found myself had in front of me three cyclists, while behind me was a car of indeterminate make in which a man had fallen asleep under... <laughs> Kenneth Williams, why do you... deviation. I would have said traffic jams, not men falling asleep. <laughs> this man had fallen asleep in a traffic jam. I feel it's entirely justified. Clement Freud is another point. He still has the subject. 29 seconds. Continue now. I sounded my horn, which I understand is an offence 
in a traffic jam, and a policeman came up to me and said, Yeah, you sounded... It's <laughs> Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. Thanks. Yes, yes. The, the policeman may have hesitated. <laughs> and you can't get out of it by saying the policeman hesitated when he spoke to me. Either. So, Geraldine, you have a point. You have 20 seconds left for the subject of traffic jams, and you start now. Traffic jams should be part of girl guides teaching because they enable you to prove how much patience and goodwill you have towards the other people on the road. If you can survive in a traffic jam without losing your temper, I think you must make a jolly good girl guide or even a jolly good boy scout. Traffic jams for me. German Freud. Three traffic jams, two girl guides. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes. But just the traffic jams will do. We don't want the girl guides and the boys guys. Anyway, there we are, Clement. You have another point. You have three seconds left for the subject of traffic jams, and you start now. On the Exeter bypass during the summer weekends, you will find. Well, as you were speaking, as the bell went, Clement, you now have another point. You still have a lead of. You've increased your lead to three over Geraldine, with Kenneth a little way behind. <laughs> Kenneth, it's your turn to start. A subject which, no doubt, someone with your horticultural background, you know, thinking of the artefacts and all those things, can discourse on at great length, but just a minute will do. Puffballs. Starting <laughs> now. Well, I don't see what their knowledge of botany's got to do with it. Puffballs, as everybody knows, is a breakfast food. Puffballs. <laughs> you pour the milk on them and they make these funny noises. And they're also delicious. They've got this sort of honey stuff coated on the outside of them. And they crunch in your mouth because they're ball. They're puffed up, of course. And naturally, when you crunch them, you, you <laughs> disturb... Uh, Geraldine. A repetition of crunching all the time. No, I admit you had it for hesitation, but I don't think there's any repetition. Was there a repetition of crunching? Did you think there was a repetition, repetition of crunching? Hesitant repetition of crunching. No, no, no. <laughs> Kenneth, you still have the subject. You've got the audience with you as well, I can see that. <laughs> you have another point. You have um, 37 seconds left for puffballs starting now. Well, these puffballs are very nice, as I say, if you like all that crunching and the noises in the morning. But personally, I try to steer clear of it because I think that a, a cup of coffee is quite enough to begin the day... Uh, Geraldine. Oh. Deviation from puffballs to breakfast habits. <laughs> well, I think these particular puffballs of Kenneth Williams could certainly give you strange breakfast habits. Kenneth, I'm still with you. Oh? Yes, you're going to get <laughs> You don't want it. Well, yes. Well, you've got it. Puffballs starting now. Yes, well, there, there are other kinds of puffballs, of course. I mean, we all, we all know that. Uh, Clement Freud. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. Puffballs, Clement Freud. Twenty... <laughs> One second's left, starting now. Botanically speaking, these are white, fluffy, cotton wool... Uh, Kenneth Williams. They're not white, fluffy, cotton wool. <laughs> Clement, would you like to justify what you're going to say? Yes, I would. Botanically speaking, they are white, fluffy, you cotton... You can't do that. <laughs> Kenneth, you I cannot challenge it. on a challenge. <laughs> Take your finger off your buzzer and let Clement Freud finish his sentence. See if he can justify it. Clement, yes. Botanically speaking. They are white, circular <laughs> globules of fluff, which are called fluff balls. I they thought just... they were called puff balls. Of course they are. Also known as puff balls. That's right. <laughs> And on any summer's afternoon... All right, I'm only you asking can... you to justify it. I agree with you. Kenneth's challenge was unjustified. You have another oh. point. You have the subject of 16 seconds. Don't look like that, Kenneth, because it honestly won't get you a point. Uh, <laughs> 16 seconds there for puffballs, Clement, starting now. One of the most uplifting things about puffballs is that you can take them in your hand and blow gently down the palm of your hand towards the tips of your fingers. And these... <laughs> Kenneth Williams. Deviation. Would you? Nothing to do with puffballs, whether you're blowing them down your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, Kenneth. I'll give the subject back to you then. <laughs> and you have seven seconds left for puffballs, starting now. Well, of course, it falls to me to right this terrible wrong. I mean, they are not white, fluffy things that he's talking about. They are. They look like a toad. Well, that last terrific burst of speed from Kenneth Williams on the back of his puffballs brought him right up, equal with Geraldine uh, Jones. Uh, they are both second. But anyway, the winner is definitely Clement Freud. <laughs> the 
chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messeter and produced by David Hatch. And Kenneth Williams, Nicholas Parsons and Geraldine Jones in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is this week's chairman, Clement Freud. Thank you for that tumultuous reception. Um, I'm here surrounded by buzzers and stopwatches and Nicholas Parsons. And I also have a list of unlikely subjects for the panel to talk about for 60 seconds each without pausing, without going off the subject, and without repetition. In other words, keep going, stick to the point, don't repeat yourself. Kenneth Williams, will you talk for one minute on making an entrance, starting now? Well, as the poet has it, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players, they have their exits and their entrances. And that is absolutely true. We come into this world naked, indeed we come into it quite naked, and after that we've got to make entrances in a different way. We can't come in naked, obviously. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. Well, there was repetition of his nakedness. Yes, that's... And I would say that uh, Kenneth don't, Williams... Don't, don't spoil it for yourself. All right. <laughs> You have a point. You are making an entrance. You have 37 seconds starting now. Well, I'm delighted to think that I have 37 seconds starting now in which to make a... Kenneth Williams. Deviation. You're absolutely right because I made a mistake. He had 47 seconds. It was the... Oh! <laughs> Kenneth Williams. Wait till I'm back on the channel chair again. You have 39 seconds making an entrance starting now. There are two kites. Nicholas Parsons. Deviation, because you said 37 seconds before, you said 39 now. So if it was wrong for me, it is also deviation for Kenneth. You're talking nonsense, Kenneth. <laughs> no points awarded, but you have the subject back. Thank you. There, well, there's the entrance, of course, on the stage, and there's the entrance in private life at a cocktail party or something like that. And I think all of us agree that when we do make an entrance, our initial... Nicholas Parsons. Oh, Three think... entrances, repetition. Yes. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons, you have... 28 seconds, making an entrance, starting now. Well, I'm delighted to think that this time I have 28... Again repetition. and again. Yes, yes. he keeps on about it. He keeps on being delighted twice. He's throbbing with it. Geraldine Jones, you have a point. Ridiculous. Kenneth Williams, will you stop throbbing? <laughs> making an entrance, 25 seconds, starting now. When you're making an entrance, whether it's in a brick wall or at a gathering, you have to remember what materials you have. It's no use making an entrance in a stunning black dress if you're going to be going to a party where... Nicholas Parsons. Hesitation. Hesitation is right. Yes. You have 13 seconds, starting now. I'm horrified to think that I have... <laughs> Kenneth Williams. Deviation. Whether it's horrified or not, it's not the point. I mean, we discussed it. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons, you have three seconds in which to justify. I'm horrified to think you want me to speak for 13 seconds about making an entrance. I think Kenneth Williams has a very good point indeed. <laughs> and you have eight seconds making an entrance starting now. Making an entrance means that... Nicholas Parsons. Repetition. He's Repetition made so right. many entrances already. Right. <laughs> yes. Six seconds making an entrance now. I don't really wish to speak about this subject. If he doesn't wish to speak about it, why start? Under what general heading was that complaint? I? Under what general? <laughs> There's deviation. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll give you a deviation. May, you have the may subject. I justify myself, Sherman? Not again. <laughs> Three may seconds. Starting now. I once made an entrance as Nefertiti, and it was fabulous. They all went raving when I came in as Nefertiti, and the end, I, it was actually not. I had this crepe hat, the crepe hat on me, and it was really fantastic. Nicholas Parsons. Well, he said entrance again. He's already said it about seven times. 
You have the subject for one second, starting now. I will speak about making an entrance. It's disgraceful. You, reluct- you reluctantly get a point because you were talking when the buzzer went. Nicholas Parsons has the next <laughs> subject. Will you speak for one minute, please, on the Parsons nose? <laughs> starting now. It is very curious that you should ask me to speak about Parsons' nose. I feel that probably I have a special reason for talking about this particular subject. Of course, many of you may not know that the derivation of this particular phrase arose from the Scottish McNose clan. They, of course, under the, deviated from the established church of Scotland, and when they drifted south, being clerics, of course, they adopted the Parsons. They dropped the Mac and kept the nose. This is, of course, the derivation of Parsons' nose, as, of course, I know only too well. Geraldine Jones. Repetition. Of, of what? what? Of derivation. He explained this before he started. Yes, that's true. He also said, of course, five times. Geraldine Jones, you have the Parsons' nose for 25 seconds, starting now. It's very difficult for me to talk about this because, situated as we are, Nicholas Parsons is to the left of me and I can't really speak into the microphone at the same time as I look at his nose. Fortunately, it's made such a vivid impression upon my memory that I can talk about it without actually looking at it. It's, it's perhaps not... Nicholas Parsons. Hesitation. I'm afraid, yes. Hesitation. You have it back, your own nose, for eight seconds. <laughs> Which came first, the curate or the egg? Now, of course, those of you who know the answer to this very simple riddle know that... Geraldine Jones. Deviation. I couldn't agree more. Deviation. (laughs) Parsons nose, two seconds, starting now. It's perhaps not a terribly memorable nose. (laughs) Geraldine gets an extra point because she was talking when the bell went for the minute. Geraldine, you have the next subject. Will you speak for one minute? on the subject of trunks, starting now. Trunks are without doubt the most provocative and charming part of the clothes of any young male elephant. It doesn't really matter whether the trunk is pink (laughs) or grey, it has that look about it that distinguishes elephants from all the other horrible big animals and makes you somehow think they're rather sweet and nice. Why is it that everyone likes elephants? It's because they have super trunks. We've had three elephants and four trunks. (laughs) Repetition. And you have one trunk, and you have 40 seconds, starting now. Some people have referred to Parsons' nose as a trunk. This, of course, is completely untrue. The trunks are really more in the enlightened way of thinking about this, the trunks that you see on people when they are swimming. When you see someone go splash into the water and he comes out without his trunks, you're out. Geraldine Jones. Lots of trunks. Roughly the same number of trunks. <laughs> You have a point, you have 21 seconds, trunks starting now. All the expression in an elephant's face is concentrated in his trunk. When he's happy, it waves up in the air. When he's sad, it sags listlessly downwards. Kenneth Williams. Hesitation. It's a very minor hesitation. All right. You haven't spoken for a while. Thank you. (laughs) 11 seconds on trunks starting now. Some people, and indeed I've seen them, they take as much as 24 pieces of luggage on a holiday, but the most important piece of luggage for a long holiday is, of course, your trunk. You've got to have a large, capacious trunk in which you can stuff every... Nicholas Parsons. (laughs) Repetition of trunks. You have one second to go on trunks starting now. When it is... Hesitation. Hesitation. I thought a definite hesitation, Kenneth Williams, is completely right. You have 0.8 of a second starting now. (laughs) Definite hesitation. I never got it out. (laughs) Nicholas Parsons starting now. Trunks! Nicholas Parsons has an extra point because the bell rang. Kenneth Williams, you have the next subject. Will you speak for one minute on keeping pets, starting now? Oh, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> I, sorry, I was challenging myself. That's ridiculous. <laughs> keeping pets. Well, I once had this goldfish, and it just went round and round in this bowl, and I got very fond of it, you know, but all this stuff started creeping all over it, a sort of uh, hazy, misty stuff, and I took it to this bloke, and he said, oh, yes, well, it means that you've had impure water in the tank, and so what I suggest is you take it out and scrape it all off, and I thought, oh, I don't... <laughs> I don't want to hold it in my hand and actually scrape it all off. I'm... 
Nicholas Parsons. All very devious. But he also was repeating the scraping in the hand. I don't really agree. I was fascinated. I was revolted, <laughs> actually. Kenneth Williams, another point, and you have 47 seconds, starting now. Yes, so I gave up the goldfish, you see, and I buried it. I did a nice little plaque over the top, but that was neither here nor there. Geraldine Jones. You can't keep a dead pet, so it's deviation. I would have thought this is exactly the way to keep a pet. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Williams, you have another point. You have 30 seconds, starting now. So I moved on to get another pet instead, you see, and this pet was a hamster. Now, hamsters are very curious things because they need an awful lot of warmth, you know. They do need warmth, you see. So I had it in Geraldine a box Jones. behind the lavatory. <laughs> Repetition. Of warmth. You have the subject, you have 17 seconds, starting now. Keeping pets is something I never, ever want to do. Occasionally, I've stayed at houses where people... Kenneth Williams. Deviation, we're discussing keeping pets, not what she doesn't want to do. <laughs> no. What if she don't want to Jody do it? Don't you have another point? You have 13 seconds That's starting just... now. I'm absolutely convinced that the only people who keep pets are lunatics. Nicholas Parsons. Repetition, she's been keeping pets. Since <laughs> I think I'm going to make a ruling here. Each... The interruptions are coming so fast and furious, each person may repeat the subject once without being buzzed by the others for repetition. Is that fair? Yeah. Right, eight seconds, Geraldine Jones. No points given to anyone for that, starting now. The whole house revolves around this business, and it's always terribly uncomfortable for any visitors. You have to be careful where you go. You have to bear in mind that some of your dinner goes to the dog. Geraldine gets a point for speaking when the bell goes. Nicholas, you have the next subject, which is getting bubbles into soda water. <laughs> Will you speak for one minute, starting now? Anybody who's ever tried to get a bubble into soda water will know it's a very difficult process. First of all, you must, of course, have your water. It's essential to get some bubbles in it because that gives you the essential pst. And if you haven't got any pst coming out, you know very well... Kenneth Williams. Repetition. No, only a single repetition. If you don't subject. have this particular noise occurring when you press the handle of your soda siphon, you will know that your whiskey or whatever else you are topping up will not have quite the same flavour as if you didn't have that pssst noise. This is, of course, very difficult if you have got the particular... Kenneth Williams. Deviation. What's all this got to do with pressing your siphon? What's it got to do with getting any bubbles in the water? Quite right. Thank you. Deviation is right. You have a point. You have a subject. You have 25 seconds starting now. Everyone knows the bubbles are put in by these monks who blow it in. <laughs> They're famous for it. The monks of Buckfast Abbey blow the, the water, the blow the air into... Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> I hate to stop him, but I think there was hesitation. There was hesitation. You have the subject back, getting bubbles into soda water starting now. As everybody knows, the monks of Belfast do not blow the bubbles in... I didn't say Belfast. <laughs> Nobody, I but nobody said. You that did. I never said. I you said did. Back fast. Back fast. But I never said. I never said you said it. Mm. I was talking oh, about we the monks of Belfast. We don't penalise for deafness. Oh. You have the subject back. You have under a quarter of a minute. Starting now. When I was last in Buckfast, I was talking to a chap who knows a great deal about this subject, and he said to me, Fruits are the greatest reader, Fruities eaters are the soda fruit and sit a reet and da, dry da, the priest and the soda fruit and three do. Geraldine Jones. I can't understand it, but it sounds awfully repetitive. <laughs> no. Nick, start now. Anybody who knows our delightful English dialects will know this is a very simple thing. It means that you must have <laughs> bubbles. Kenneth Williams. What have dialects got to do with bubbles in the water? It's deviation, and you know it, Clement. Now, come on. <laughs> you have one point, and you have one second to go on getting bubbles into soda water, starting now. As I said before, you blow them in. The challenge was too late. The point goes to Kenneth Williams. The score now is Nicholas Parsons still in the lead. Oh! Closely followed by Kenneth Williams, who is two points behind. Some way in front of Geraldine Jones, who is lying <laughs> third. But has the next subject, which is hesitation. 
And in this subject, you do not use the indefinite article A. So will you speak for one minute on hesitation without using the indefinite article A, starting now. The important thing to remember about hesitation is that it's a tremendously valuable asset. Anyone who... It Nicholas is Barton. a de very tremendously, a tremendously Quite right, you have a point, you have the subject, you have 53 seconds, starting now. Just think how difficult it is to play this game when you have two people sitting beside you with buzzers in their hand, their fingers ready to press them at the slightest deviation, hesitation. Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. Yes. <laughs> yes. Geraldine Jones, you have a point, you have the subject, hesitation. 33 seconds to go, starting now. Everything that is enjoyable is made more enjoyable by hesitation. Things which are not enjoyable are made... Kenneth Williams. Enjoyable, we had twice. <laughs> Repetition? Yes, quite. Right, you have a point, you have the subject, starting now. Hesitation, as the poet says, he who hesitates is lost. And, of course, this remains a fundamental. <laughs> Geraldine Jones. A fundamental. Quite right. You have a point, you have the subject. Oh, 20 I seconds never... to go, <laughs> starting now. <laughs> starting now. If you like doing something, it's much nicer if you pause before you start doing it. If you don't like it, you pause and then you put off doing it. Nicholas Barton. She was doing it an awful lot. <laughs> Repetition. I thought she was doing it once too often. You have the subject. Uh, you have eight seconds to go, starting uh, now. Uh, Hesitation. <laughs> is a subject which Kenneth Williams, when he plays to the audience here and gets laughs which the listeners know nothing about, will only... <laughs> Nicholas, you have another point and a commanding lead. Mm -hmm. And Kenneth Williams, you have the next subject, which is my favourite meal, which we would like to, you to talk about for one minute without using the personal pronoun I. My favourite meal without using the word I. It's impossible, starting Kenneth Williams. Now. <laughs> well, there's your boiled beef and carrots, of course, which is a staple of the Cockney diet. Then, of course, there's your liver and bacon. Then, of course, for me... Nick, Geraldine Jones. Uh, we haven't got to his favourite meal yet. Deviation. <laughs> I think I'll ask the audience. Now, let's do it simultaneously. If you think Geraldine Jones is right, will you cheer? If you think Kenneth Williams is right, will you boo? Now! <laughs> Kenneth Williams is right. <laughs> Start More. now. Then after that you have your steak and kidney pudding. This is absolutely delicious, but it must be taken fresh from the oven. It's no good having it otted up. That's no good. Geraldine Jones. I insist this isn't about my favourite meal. It, it's about food in general. I think you're right. You have the subject. You have 37 <laughs> seconds to go. My favourite meal without using the word I, starting now. My favourite meal changes from time to time. Kenneth Williams. Oh, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's a dust off statement, isn't it? I mean, how can your favourite meal change? You can't have a favourite meal. Wait, <laughs> wait. Geraldine Jones, you have a point. You didn't let you me keep wait, the subject. Did you, dear? <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Geraldine Jones, my favourite meal, starting now. The essence of such a thing is that you don't always have, have it, it, that it changes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think just... I ought to tell listeners that that was really the nastiest bit of intimidation. <laughs> I think she was very hesitating, intimate. but I think it was very unfair, and I'd like to give the point that I know I'm going to win for this back to Geraldine Jones and the subject. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Geraldine Jones, you have a point and you have the subject. You have 29 seconds starting now. My favourite meal must be eaten in the company of such gallant gentlemen as Nicholas Parsons, who give me points that I don't really deserve. When I say that it changes, I mean that if you go on eating the same thing over and over again, it ceases to be favourite. Nicholas Parsons. Repetition over and over again is definite repetition. <laughs> Must I would have be. been more impressed if you had said, she said the word I. Oh, yes, she said that as well, but I thought... <laughs> Geraldine Jones, you have a point, you have the subject. I was sorry. You have 15 seconds to go, starting now. It always changes, because you can't, you get so sick of the same thing. Nicholas Parsons. Hesitation. <laughs> yes, right. Right. You have the subject, 10 seconds to go, starting now. I don't know what this subject is, but I will... <laughs> Geraldine Jones. I. You have a point. 
my favorite meal starting now. Sometimes it's steak, sometimes it's salmon, sometimes... Nicholas Parsons? Sometimes, three times. <laughs> Repetition. A point, five seconds to go, starting now. My favorite meal is a conglomeration of the dishes which go on the table with such precision. <laughs> At the latter end of the scale, Geraldine Jones and Kenneth Williams are now even. Unfortunately, seven points behind Nicholas Parsons, <laughs> who has the next subject, the best way of entertaining friends without using the word the. The best way of entertaining friends starting now. Best way of entertaining friends. <laughs> it's impossible to talk about this subject. It begins with this uh, definite <laughs> article. Geraldine Jones, you, you challenged. Hesitation. You have a point. You also have the best way of entertaining friends starting now. You must always bear in mind what your friends like doing. This is undoubtedly invisible. <laughs> when... Invisible. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. Hesitation. Right. You have the subject starting now. When I'm entertaining my friends, my first thought is to ask Clement Freud to come with around to dinner. Or... Ken Williams. Deviation. No. Nicholas Parson, you have another point, and you keep the subject. I also like to ask Kenneth Williams, in spite of the fact that... Fa <laughs> Geraldine Jones. The. You're right, you have a point, you have the subject. You have 37 seconds starting now. Too many people, when entertaining friends, think only of themselves, and this leads to a number of awfully boring evenings. I've sat through innumerable such events. Hesitation. Reluctantly, yes. You have a point. You have the subject starting now. My favourite guest to entertain is Geraldine Jones. She is the most de uh, delight... <laughs> Geraldine Jones. Modesty impels me to say hesitation. You have the subject now. Entertainment is often a very boring affair, which is quite the opposite of... Kenneth Williams. We had boring before. She's already done that. She said it was... She sat through all these boring eves. Now we're off again on boring. Yes, she did. You have a point. You have the subject. You have 18 seconds starting now. Entertaining. Well, of course, you come into the room and you... Geraldine Jones. The room. Oh, I Quite didn't right. realise that. <laughs> Geraldine Jones, 14 seconds to go. The best way of no. entertaining friends starting now. When people try to entertain friends deliberately, they always fail. You have to let people do what they want. This is invariably a very good... Nicholas Parsons. Well, hesitation... Yes, you're right. You have the subject starting now. When you have Clement Freud in your kitchen and he refuses to cook, the best thing is to twist his uh, arm. You said the, but you didn't challenge. Nicholas Parsons said the. Kenneth Williams looked at him, but didn't press his buzzer. So Nicholas Parsons has another point. And is now in a commanding lead. But Geraldine Jones is second and Kenneth Williams is last. Geraldine, it's your subject. Will you talk for one minute on bowling, starting now? This is a terribly technical subject, which I know nothing about. When I was at school, we had to play cricket, and part of learning to play this game involved learning how to bowl. It always involved such an enormous expenditure of effort, not just running, but wheeling around with your arms as well, that I decided very early on I would never, ever learn to bowl. Other people, I believe, do. Occasionally, my father forces me to watch cricket on television as part of widening my educational horizons. When I do, I always find it terribly boring, and particularly the part where the the man bowls. It takes such a dreadfully... Nicholas That's Parsons. the third bowl we've had. <laughs> Actually, there were four, I think, but definitely. She's bowling Christ, when she talked about ungallant. bowling school and bowling. No, she had been for a very long time. Yes, 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 don't go on. <laughs> You're such a hard man, as Kenneth said. <laughs> I Nicholas Parsons, you lose a point for... You lose a point for repeating yourself on the challenge. Yes, he loses it. But you get the subject, bowling. You have 35 seconds to go, starting now. Bowling is, of course, a gentle, lovely game. Upon the green swords of England, you will see these delightful elderly people with their little rolled-up mats railing down on one knee and tossing the ball gently across the green sward until it comes up against the little white pill the other end. Sometimes they say, Yeah, it's your turn, Mabel. You see if you can beat that one, because I bowled a good one. See if you can do it better. <laughs> Oh, it's brilliant, isn't it? Very good. 
I like the bit about navel. Commendable <laughs> point one by Nicholas Parsons <laughs> on bowling. That is it. And Nicholas Parsons wins with 33 points, for which I think mm. he deserves a small modicum of applause. I don't. I think it's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. All cheating. Yes, Geraldine Jones, who was my own particular selection, as many of you must have noticed, came second with 20, what, 25 points. And Kenneth Williams came last. Goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute this week was Clement Freud. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. Kenneth Williams, Nicholas Parsons and Clement Freud in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it in the chair this week is Geraldine Jones. Well, thank you. Here I am, surrounded by buzzers and stopwatches and a lot of rules which I'll explain as we go along. I also have a list of unlikely subjects for the panel to talk about for 60 seconds each without pausing or going off the subject or repeating themselves. In other words, they have to keep going, stick to the point and not say anything twice. The first round begins with Kenneth Williams. Will you please talk for one minute on how to eat macaroni delicately and without cutting it starting now? <laughs> macaroni, this is a wheaten paste. I think it's important that we define the thing. It's a wheaten paste uh, squeezed into a sort of tube-like shape. And the best way is to take it on your fork and to twist it so that the whole thing is eventually bunched, so to speak, on the end of the fork. And then you convey it to your mouth. In this way, of course, you... Nicholas Parsons. Hesitation. Yes, terribly informative, but I think he was hesitating. So Nicholas Parsons gains a point and has 33 seconds on how to eat macaroni, etc., starting now. Well, the art of doing this, of course, is something which has been lost to the younger generation. Brought up on op and populence, they... Clement Freud. Deviation. In what way? Hasn't mentioned macaroni decorously <laughs> ever. <laughs> Could have been talking about frying spaghetti instead of eating macaroni. Uh, fair enough. <gasps> Clement, Freud... <laughs> Clement Freud has 25 seconds on how to eat macaroni, starting now. Ideally, you get a fork in your left hand and a spoon in your right hand. You get hold of this former implement, pierce the macaroni... <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. Hesitation. Yes. No, I, I don't no think No sense of the theatre, has he? Have you noticed? <laughs> I, I, I think you have to make you allowances know, for natural slowness of speech. Clement Freud gets another point and has 14 seconds, starting now. And so having got the macaroni in the spoon, you twist your... Nicholas Parsons. Repetition of macaroni. <laughs> yes, all right. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons, you have a point and 12 seconds starting now. The famous Italian chef, Signor Gunta Panciato, once said to me, when you get to your macaroni, you've got to stuff it right up the shoulder spot. You've got to get the round part, because if you don't get it round or smooth, you don't get that twisty thing. You've got to have the twisty, because that is so lovely. Fine. Well, at the end of the first round, Nicholas Parsons is just leading from Clement Freud, and Kenneth Williams so far hasn't any points at all. Ah. <laughs> now, Nicholas Parsons' turn. Will you please talk for one minute on mumbo-jumbo starting now? 
Mumbo Jumbo Jabberwocky come thing. This is how now. Well, I thought come along the branch and step out along the rail. I thought he was. He, no, you come there and if what gives the gift he give us now. I saw it come. And then again, some people say this and some say that. But what would you? Ha ha! Not I. But then there is a point which says, come now. Is it him? Is it him? Is it there? Is it Williams? Is it Freud? No, but come. It, it, this is a point. And so we step forth. We take our hands. We cut them together. We look up and we look down because there is a way around. I I thought perhaps this was it, and you said no, and the cut... Kevin Freud. I didn't understand it. <laughs> Which rule was he breaking? He repeated mumbo-jumbo. What does the audience think? If you think that Clement Freud is right and Nicholas Parsons was repeating himself, will you cheer? If you think Clement Freud was wrong, will you boo? All now. <laughs> The audience is very much with Nicholas Parsons, who gains a point and has 12 seconds left starting now. Oh. Clement Freud. <laughs> Clement Freud. Hesitation. Yes. <laughs> Vir virtuoso. Virtuoso as Nicholas Parsons is, I think he did hesitate there. <laughs> Clement Freud has 11 and a half seconds on Mumbo Jumbo starting now. That's it. <laughs> Hesitation. Yes, such gallantry between you is very perturbing. Um, Nicholas Parsons, you have another point and nine and a half seconds starting now. Mumbo Jumbo was a very happy little elephant and as he walked down to the river one day, his daddy said to him, come along little boy. Well, at the end of that round, it's Nicholas Parsons way in the lead, uh, Clement Freud second, and Kenneth Williams still very much behind. Thank you, rabbit in. <laughs> I, I say no more than the truth. Mm. Clement Freud, it's your turn now. Will you talk, please, for one minute on getting out of jail, starting now? The most important thing about this subject is to get into jail in the first place, <laughs> in order that you can start on this exercise. I would like to commend to listeners a number of useful ways of getting into jail. One of them would be to attack Nicholas Parsons with a blunt instrument. <laughs> uh, this would cover a multitude of useful causes, like removing the enemy. Nicholas Parsons. Hesitation. It was indeed hesitation. 31 seconds on getting out of jail, starting now. In order to get out of jail successfully, you must first read the small print in your contract. It usually goes something like this. Subtection... Kenneth Williams. Well, uh, hesitation, but certainly deviation as well, because we're supposed to be discussing getting out of jail, not your contract. Let's face it. I think you're right. Yes. It, it did seem you a say. bit devious. <laughs> Nine, Kenneth Williams now breaks. breaks spectacularly into the game and has 21 seconds to talk about getting out of jail starting now. The first thing, obviously, to do is to get hold of a very good lawyer. That's the first thing to do. <laughs> then, on the other hand, if you can't get hold of a very good lawyer, then you want to get a rope ladder and a file. <laughs> you can smuggle in nail files in loaves of bread. I know that goes on because I've read all these books about it. And then you saw through bars and lower your... Oh, thank you. We start a new round now with Kenneth Williams. Uh, will you talk, please, for one minute on Hocus Pocus, starting now? Hocus Pocus. Well, this is a very interesting word, Hocus Pocus. It is derived, of course, from the term uh, Hax, Pax, Max, Deus, um, something, add, add, add something or other. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. I haven't finished. <laughs> I hate to do it, but I do think you were hesitating, Kenneth. Yes, I, I'm sure. lovely bit. <laughs> I, I'm sure great things were to come, but too yes. slowly. So, Nicholas Parsons gains a point oh. and has 22 and a half seconds left 
on Hocus Pocus starting now. Uh, Hocus Pocus, of course, was the chief leader of the witches in the little gnome story. And one day, as they were going down into the forest, <laughs> there was a great big gnome there who said, Come along, children, let us go this way. And the tree... Kenneth Williams. Deviation. Nothing to do with Hocus Pocus. Just a fairy story, that was. Deviation. <laughs> Yes, I, I happen to be very knowledgeable about Hocus Pocus, and I agree with you, Kenneth Williams. Yes. So you gain a point you and have 28 I... seconds starting now. Yes, as I say, it was derived from this term, which meant rather the equivalent of when you say today a magic phrase like uh, abracadabra or something like that. It really means Hocus Pocus to take someone on to... Uh, oh. Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. Ah, uh, hesitating again. <laughs> yes, you really are ruthless, but you gain another point. Well, I let him say it twice before I pressed. <laughs> That's still ruthless when he's losing so sadly. Oh, um, I'll you have... well, let him have it back. I'll give that point to Ken. No, let him go on. No, no, we don't want you showing off with magnanimity. You oh. have. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I never do in public, Geraldine. <laughs> you, you have eleven seconds on Hocus Pocus, starting now. Well, as I was saying about the children as they went into the forest, they said they were going to cast a spell. It was a real hocus-pocus type of spell, which would bring all the elves out of the trees and the little squirrels running down the branches. Of course... Clement Freud. Clement Freud. It was boring. <laughs> Um, I, I think from the applause that the audience agrees with, with you. Yes, fair enough. Uh, a new rule has been born. You have only one second left, starting now. I won't. <laughs> and, and Clement Freud just got that point for ending on the bell. Um, the score now, still Nicholas Parsons in the lead, Clement Freud next, and Kenneth Williams third. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons' turn. Um, will you please talk for one minute on my most miserable moment, starting now? My most miserable moment was probably when I was asked to be on the panel of Just a Minute. <laughs> I had been extremely happy being chairman of this game. I didn't realise how difficult and how impossible it was, and to me it was a miserable time of my life. I have endeavoured to come over, come and come back again to conquer this particular moment <laughs> in my time. And I hope that successfully I may have done it, because to speak without hesitation... Clement Freud. Deviation. <laughs> he hasn't done it. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, does the audience agree that it was a bit of waffle? Um, if you do, cheer. And if you don't, boo. If you... Well, the audience thinks Nicholas Parsons was waffling. Clement Freud gets a point <laughs> and has... You've got it wrong. 34 seconds on his most miserable moment, starting now. It happened at 11.15 on the 18th of August, 1944. I was filling sandbags at number 28, Netherhill Gardens, Crowthorn in Berkshire, which is in the southwest of England. When this moment suddenly came up, the telephone rang. I picked up the receiver and said, Hello, this is Crowth... Nicholas Parsons. That's even more boring than what I said. <laughs> I think, in fact, that it sounded utterly miserable, and probably because it was so miserable, it was boring. Clement Freud gains another point and has five seconds starting now. I said Crowthorn 489653167 and the... Nicholas Parsons. Repetition of numbers. 4567897. No, they were all different numbers, so <laughs> Clement were... Freud gets another point. <laughs> Opened favoritism. And has two seconds left, starting now. And the woman said, I think you've got the wrong number. Um, well, after my impartial chairing, um, Nicholas Parsons and Clement Freud are now level, and Kenneth Williams is in second place. Quite <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's, Don't worry, she'll favour you this time. Yes. It's now Clement Freud's turn to talk for one minute, please, on disposing of orange pips, starting now. <laughs> These are definitely the best colour pips of which to dispose. <laughs> I have tried to dispose of many other coloured pips without success, and so I'll confine myself in this brief talk to the subject on the card. The best... Kenneth Williams. Hesitation. Yes. Yes, I think oh. it was hesitation. Uh, a point to Kenneth Williams. You have... 40... 43... <laughs> 
You have 43 seconds on disposing of orange pips starting now. Well, of course, there are various ways of disposing of orange pips. I have seen some people just spit them out <laughs> at passers-by. You know, actually, some people can spit them out with such velocity that they are capable of hitting people as they pass by. <laughs> I've seen them get it right in the eye on orange pips. <laughs> on the other hand, some people surreptitiously sort of get them into the hand and then sort of glide away somewhere. You don't really know where it's all going. It might be on the floor, for all you know. And others, of course, put them into spoons and lower them onto the plate. Some people have a bit of paper into which they put them. But on the whole, I think the whole business of... I didn't repeat there, it was just... Nicholas Parsons. Hesitation. No. Yes, I, I think he was beginning to run down a bit. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons... You sound like a bit of clockwork. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons gets a point and has six seconds on disposing of orange pips starting now. The best way to dispose of an orange pip is to put it into the ground and within a short space of time the fermentation press will take... Oh. <laughs> Kenneth Williams, it's your turn now. Would you talk for one minute, please, on being measured for a suit? But you have to talk on this subject without saying two spelt T O, two spelt T double O, and two spelt T W O. So no twos are allowed. Being measured for a suit starting now. Well, being measured for a suit can be an extremely luxurious experience. There is a nice feeling, I think, when people say, well, now, just stand here, just slip off the jacket, I'll just measure you across the shoulders, I'll measure under arm, measure your waist. Of course, that time, it's a bit much, because you suddenly realise that you have put it on a bit, perhaps, you see, and that's not very nice. I say, oh, hello, he was 30 last time, 31 here. <laughs> have to lay off the starch, I think, and the port. Uh, lay off the wines and all that sort of thing. That can be very embarrassing indeed. I haven't said two yet, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Clement Freud. Two. Yes, he did. He, he challenged you to challenge him. So Clement Freud gains a point and has 21 seconds starting now. Et tu, Brute. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. You used two words. <laughs> uh, no, that, two. that's not allowed. He said two. No, yes, said but I specified, you see, how the two was to be spelled. He no and yes, but, but it wasn't that too. I know Clement Freud, he doesn't speak Latin normally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that he does. And even if he doesn't, the Latin is correctly spelled T-U. My education has at last been of some use to me. And so Clement Freud gains another point and still has 19 seconds starting now. The tailor takes his tape and runs down my inside thigh measurements, which he does with tremendous ability. 31, he shouts, then 33. He then goes to my waist. Nicholas Parsons. To my waist. Well then. Yes, you're right. Um, you have one point and seven seconds on being measured for a suit starting now. Being measured for a suit is one of the luxurious things of life. <laughs> <laughs> Clement Freud. Hesitation. Yes. Yes, he was fumbling a bit, I think. Um, yes, um, he was Miss, definitely Miss, fumbling. Miss <laughs> Lady <laughs> Chairman. Madam Chairman. May, may I say, you're, you're so charming and so understanding and so kind to people. I was born with an impediment. Mm -hmm. I do have a difficulty with my speech. I yes, managed to insane. conquer in my youth a very difficult stutter, and luxurious has always been one of the most difficult words. Well, mm. in saying I was charming, etc., you were saying no more than the truth, but I'm not really very sympathetic to people with impediments I in speech. I realise that. Clement Freud has a point, and She's hard. two seconds left, starting now. My waist measurement is... Nicholas Parsons. Repetition. He used the word waste before. No, I I'm going to give it to Clement Freud. He has one second left, starting now. Yes. <laughs> well, at the end of that round, Clement Freud has made a, a staggering leap to the first place. Nicholas Parsons is in second, and Kenneth Williams, alas, still in third. Nicholas Parsons, it's your turn now. Will you... Okay talk for one minute, please, on how to open a bazaar without saying the word the, starting now. Opening a bazaar is a bazaar experience. The whole point is... Clement Freud. The whole point. Yes, he did. Um, you have 55 seconds on how to open a bazaar starting now. Ladies and gentlemen who have come unto my garden this afternoon, 
I welcome you all most sincerely from a deep down part. Nicholas Parsons. He's getting so slow, you know, it's obvious hesitation. You can't... Uh, I, I agree, you don't need to argue it. I'm surprised you didn't interrupt sooner. <laughs> well, I was afraid of being penalised. You gain... <laughs> I'm always fair. You gain one point. How to open a bazaar starting now? You take occasion which is, after all, the thought of... Clement Freud. The thought. Yes, unfortunately for Nicholas Parsons, Clement Freud gains a point and has 25 seconds starting now. My Lord Mayor, you chaps over there, gentlemen... Kenneth Williams. Deviation, Lord Mayors aren't a bazaar. That's ludicrous. <laughs> um... Well, I suppose very posh bazaars, maybe not in general. Kenneth Williams gains a point and has 19 seconds to talk about how to open a bazaar without using the word the, starting now. You get up and you say something which is reasonably funny to open your speech and then you cut the ribbon and... Clement Freud. <laughs> the ribbon? Yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, oh. You have gained a point... <laughs> You've gained a point and you have nine seconds starting now. Any old ribbon and any pair of scissors will do this job handsomely. Ideally, it should be conducted by someone wearing a bright... <laughs> Clement Freud gained another point for finishing on the bell and he's now substantially in the lead from Nicholas Parsons and Kenneth Williams in third place. Uh, now, Kenneth Williams' turn. Will you talk, please, for one minute on the sport I least enjoy starting now? Well, that's not very difficult for me because I don't really enjoy any of them. And I think, <laughs> I think it's very significant that the real brains of this world are not to be found rushing about on a, on a football field chasing something that's got a lot of air in it and a bit of rubber. I don't think you'll find them there, no. And it's said by some people that sport's a very good thing because it's supposed to get rid of a lot of aggressive instincts. And I think that's a load rubbish too because it's been consistently proved time and time again that the only way you get rid of such instincts is by the guilt guilt you have to have guilt Nicholas, <laughs> Nicholas Parsons repetition of guilt and again yes, all right but I was using it in the sense of gold <laughs> <laughs> no I, I don't think I can accept that Nicholas Parsons gains a point and has 26 seconds on the sport I least enjoy starting now the sport I least enjoy is playing just a minute. It is considered to be a sport among some because those who play it play it in such an unsporting fashion. Clement Freud. Three sports. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is a fair definition of the team, but it's repetition. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Clement Freud gains a point and has 17 seconds starting now. Basketball is the one I least enjoy because it is intensely boring. 46 men of indeterminate ages line up on either side of a white line. Nicholas Parsons. It's getting slower and slower, and so it must be hesitation. No, I think he was keeping going, actually. There. Yes, um, but slower no, and slower. No, hesitation is more than speaking slowly, especially when you naturally speak as slowly as Clement Freud. So, Clement Freud gains a point and has three seconds left, starting now. And the left back passes the right back and passes the centre forward. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. Out of his own mouth, he proved himself by speaking not like Clement Freud. So it must be deviation. If he normally speaks slower, that is deviation to speak like that. <laughs> yes, Nicholas Parsons gets a point for cleverness, but not for knowing the rules of the game. And Clement Freud still has two seconds, starting now. Who passes the centre forward? Nicholas he Parsons. He passed in his last speech. Fair enough. Nicholas Parsons, you gain a point and have half a second, starting now. <laughs> Well, the scores are still Clement Freud in the lead, Nicholas Parsons very close behind him, and Kenneth Williams third. Nicholas Parsons, it's your turn now to talk, please, on what to do when sleep is impossible. For one minute, starting now. The best thing to do when sleep is impossible is to wake up. Having woken up, you want to think of all the most wonderful things that you possibly can. Like, for instance, those wonderful trips abroad. The last time I was in Paris, I couldn't sleep at all, so I got up, I went downstairs, I met a charming Frenchman. He said, de vie, de vie, sleep, sleep also de vie, de vie. Which, as everybody Clement knows, Freud. means when you cannot sleep... Clement Freud the has interrupted. 
Uh, why were you interrupting? Forgotten. <laughs> it was a very long time ago. Repetition. Yes, in French. Right. Um, Clement Floyd, you gain a point and have 38 seconds starting now. You lie awake and you count the pillars in your bedroom and then you count the overmantels. Kenneth Williams. Hesitation. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Very hesitant. <laughs> Kenneth Williams, you have 32 seconds on what to do when sleep is impossible starting now. When you can't sleep, the best thing to do is to have a ceremony. There is no question at all about that. You have a ceremony. You get up and you make yourself a pot of tea, red on a little cloth on the tray, have your little cups and saucers and the milk and sugar all ready, and then convey it to the bedroom on the side table. That's very nice then, because you don't feel it's all dreadful and that you can't sleep. You've suddenly made a little ceremony, you see, and you look out the window and you see all the traffic going along the road and you think, what are those people doing? Where are they going? to it this time of night, too. <laughs> and that, I'm afraid, is where we must leave it, because Just a Minute has to be off the air in just a minute. Well, then don't mention um, the marks, dear. <laughs> but I... <laughs> have time, alas, to Kenneth Williams' undying shame to mention that in this game, Clement Freud won uh, with a substantial lead over Nicholas Parsons in second place and Kenneth Williams, alas, in third place. Goodbye. In the chair for this week's Just a Minute was Geraldine Jones. The programme was devised by Ian Messeter and produced by David Hatch. Nicholas Parsons, Clement Freud and Geraldine Jones in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is this week's chairman, Kenneth Williams. Thank you, yes, it is me, your own, your own heart-rendingly lovable Kenneth Williams. And here I am surrounded by buzzers, stopwatches and a lot of rules. I also have a list of unlikely subjects for the panel to talk about for 50, I'm sorry, 60 <laughs> seconds each without pausing, without going off the subject and without repetition. In other words, keeping going and sticking to the point and not repeating themselves. Now, it's Nicholas Parsons to start and your subject this week is the days of the week starting from now. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, Mardi, Lundi, Mercredi, <laughs> Jeudi, Vendredi, Samedi, Dimanche. Lunes, Mardis, Miercoles, Jueves, Viernes, Sabado, Domingo. It's so interesting sometimes to listen to the wireless and you hear the announcer say that tomorrow will be muggy, followed by tuggy, weggy, thirgy, froggy, <laughs> soggy, and soggy. And of course, soggy are so many of the days of the week in this country, wet, miserable, and eventually so, so wet that you sometimes wonder why you ever get up in the morning to face the British weather. Now, the days of the week that... Uh, Clement Freud, what grounds are you challenging? Repetition. Repetition, oh. yes. Well, I think you're justified there, yes. I think there was a bit of repetition there. Yes. What Clement did I repeat? Um, well, I can't exactly call what, but I know there was a few things. <laughs> well, perhaps you'd better ask the audience. Do you think oh. he was repeating himself? If so, cheer. Yes. Oh, well, that's I admit it. it. I admit it. I admit it. Oh, there was repetition. Right, well, there's a point to you, Clement Freud, and you have the subject, the days of the week, starting from now. The days of the week is situated in the Chapter Hall of London University and is one of the most splendid buildings of its kind <laughs> anywhere in any European capital city. The president of this... <laughs> yes.
Yes, well, Clever Floyd, you were still speaking when the bell went, so you get a point. And at the moment, you are leading, and Nicholas Parsons and Miss Geraldine Jones are trailing along behind. We haven't so scored now, yet. <laughs> now we go to the next subject. This goes to you, Geraldine. You have 60 seconds to speak about parking meters starting from now. The essential thing to remember about parking meters is that you must always treat them with respect and affection. There are some inanimate objects like can openers which you can successfully bully, but parking meters should always be treated rather as you treat donkeys. You should feed them little coins as you feed donkeys sugar lumps. And in this way you establish a bond with the parking meter against the traffic warden because the parking meter doesn't like the traffic warden. Uh, Nicholas Parsons? I thought there was rather a lot as we had repetition, but yes. four I've counted. I got quite worked up though. I loved all yes. that stuff at the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just quite good. Really. Well, her parking meter's in a very expensive area, obviously, but there were four of them. There were four, mm. were there four parking meters? Well, there was repetition then, I'm afraid, yes, mm. I'll have to take that point. Uh, Nicholas gets a point for that, and the subject goes to you, Nicholas. You have 35 seconds in which to discuss parking meters starting from now. The best thing to do if you have a car is to put a parking meter on the back seat before you set off. <laughs> Having arrived at your destination, you get out, you stick it straight into the ground, and then you... Uh, Clever Freud? <laughs> hesitation. Hesitation, yes. I think it's quite justified. There, were, there was hesitation there, yes. <laughs> no question about it. There was a wee really bit of hesitation there. <laughs> yeah. And so, the Mr. Williams. The subject goes to Clever Freud. You have 23 seconds in which to discuss parking meters starting from now. It is a little known fact that these parking meters also accept coins of other denominations and other countries. I'm not sure whether I shall be allowed to go on with this because we're now ranging on the criminal activities, but any parking meter in London accepts one cent... Um, Nicholas Parsons? Hesitation. Hesitation, yes, I feel that's quite justified. You were hesitating there. I did feel that, yes. You don't agree? Of oh, course he agree. doesn't agree. Oh, well, we'd like the audience. We'd like the audience's views on that. No, you don't, uh, don't. We'd like the audience's view on that. Do you think Clever Fry was hesitating? If so, boo. <laughs> oh, they do think you were hesitating. Oh, <laughs> yes. So Nicholas Parsons gets point. And Nicholas, you have seven seconds approximately in which to discuss parking meters starting from now. Having... <laughs> Clever Freud, you're challenging again. Hesitation, he didn't stop. Hesitation, yes, that's nothing justified. So the subject goes back to Clever Freud, and you get a point. Him. And you have now about six seconds in which to discuss parking meters, starting from now. They are. Oh. <laughs> Hesitation. On what grounds are you challenging? Hesitation. Hesitation. Exactly the same as me. He got me on that. I'll get him as well then. <laughs> I will not have my authority flouted. <laughs> I am the chairman. <laughs> No, don't laugh, it's wicked. <laughs> I am the chairman. Yeah. Now, I've got to I decide. don't want to flout with you, Kate. I can't keep on appealing to the audience. You must understand. Now, you, 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 you retain the point, Clement, and you must discuss parking meters. You have uh, approximately five seconds, starting from now. In Northumberland Avenue, these parking meters are situated at five-yard intervals. Yes, well, at the end of that round, Clement is definitely in the lead. Clement Freud is in the lead. Nicholas is next, and I'm afraid Geraldine is trailing very far behind. <laughs> so now we go on to the next subject, which is Clement Freud's. You have 60 seconds in which to discuss wine, women, and song, <laughs> starting from now. To put it succinctly, Chateauneuf du Pape, 1949. Daphne, Deirdre, God Save the Queen. <laughs> now this, you may well think, is not the ideal way of discussing wine, women and song, but for a married man with only 53 seconds to go, it's a sort of good try. Uh, Nicholas Parsons, you're Deviation. I've got a watch in front of me. He actually has more or less than 53 seconds to go. Oh, well, yes. Okay, that's a very good point. It's a very good point. Yes, you gain a point there for Nicholas. And the subject is yours. Why Women in Song? Which was discussed now for approximately 35 seconds, starting from now. Nuit Saint-Georges, 1963. Cecilia, Cynthia and Obadiah. And songs, oh, stake me to the moon and come again, Charlie. Delightful songs. <laughs> and if you ever put all these three together, you have the title of this particular subject that I've been asked to talk about for the remaining seconds that are available to me for wine, women, and... 
Yes, Geraldine Jones, why are you challenging? Repetition. Repetition, yes, I'm afraid. It's perfectly, perfectly reasonable, I'm afraid. Yes, Geraldine Jones gains a point, and the subject is hers now. Why Women in Song, you have approximately 14 seconds starting from now. I don't think I've ever been less well qualified to talk about a subject than I am to talk about this one. I know very... Uh, Clem Freud, why is Deviation. Deviation, she, she's yes. She's not qualified. Yes, Shut I'm afraid, up. Sir, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> There. Yes. Clement, you, you gain a point there, and the subject is back with you. Wine, women, and song. You have approximately seven seconds to discuss it. There are many different kinds of wine, just as there are different women and different songs, but I'd like to concentrate on the first sentence, which is... Oh! <laughs> yes, well, at the end of that round, Clement Freud is definitely in the lead. It's a fantastic league, Clement. I must congratulate you. You're revealing <laughs> intellectual prowess. Is I never knew you. Oh, shut up! <laughs> <laughs> He's got two I, points more than us, isn't no he? No good revealing your chagrin, Nicholas. <laughs> I can actually see your chagrin from here. Mm. Uh, you are second, which is consoling, and You're Geraldine... You're flouting afraid, again, you know. I'm afraid, <laughs> lagging like the tortoise, Geraldine. You must look up. This is for you, Clement. Will you speak for 60 seconds on Benjamin Franklin, starting from now? Benjamin Franklin, as you all know, is the captain of South Hampstead Cricket Club, one of the most vile exponents of underarm bowling. It has been my... Uh... There's Nicholas Parson. Hesitation. Hesitation, I feel that's absolutely true. Yes. You, be, you have a point and you can take the subject up. Benjamin Franklin, you have, what, 45 seconds starting from now. Having played against South Hampstead cricket, I can tell you that Benjamin Franklin's bowling is devastating. The last time I went out to face him, I asked... Yes, Clement Freud. Deviation. Underarm bowling is not devastating. Yeah, precisely. I'm afraid that's a very different point. Very valid. <laughs> very valid. Yes. You get one point, Clement, and the subject goes back to you. Benjamin Franklin, you've approximately 35 seconds, starting from now. Since I first met him, he has been transferred to West Hampstead Cricket Club, for whom he bowls overarm googlies, which are quite dangerous. He intersposes these with Chinamen from time to time, but... Yes, Nicholas? While I know it's a cricketing phrase, to me it is very devious to throw a Chinaman. Throw a Chinaman? <laughs> he was throwing Chinaman, and yes. it sounds to me very... He said they were dangerous, too. Dangerous Chinaman. Bowling. Yes. Yes, I think it's a practice which should be frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't think Chinamen are there to be thrown about. And that's an absolutely valid point. Yes, valid point. And you gain a point in, in so doing, and um, you have the subject back. You have approximately 20 seconds in which to discuss Benjamin Franklin, starting from now. Of course, when I played against him and he was playing for West Hampstead cricket, some of... Okay, this is Geraldine Jones. You're challenging. Repetition. He was playing against him last time he talked. Yes, we've but, heard an awful lot club, about that. A different club. He's now, moved nonetheless, on. my Mr. rule Freud must prevail. We've heard an awful on. lot about it. Yes, a Geraldine Jones gets the subject. You've approximately 15 seconds, Geraldine, in which to discuss Benjamin Franklin starting from now. The only Benjamin Franklin I have ever heard of, as the audience has only ever heard of him, is the American president. I don't quite know when he lived, but I believe that he has his head on some American coin and all Americans, being patriotic people, look upon him with a sort of friendly benevolence. Yes, well, the next subject, this is for Nicholas, Nicholas Parsons. The subject is stirring up a hornet's nest. You have 60 seconds to discuss. Stirring up a hornet's nest without saying the, T-H-E, the. You must not say the, but you have 60 seconds to discuss stirring up a hornet's nest starting from now. One of the most... <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's perfectly true. Yes, it was the, wasn't it? He said the, Clement. Yes, you're quite right. You gain a point and you have the subject stirring up a hornet's nest without saying the starting from now. One of a very unusual series of accidents befell me when I met some hornets walking down a street in Bayswater Village, which, as you all know, is outside Wiltshire Crematorium near Shaftesbury. <laughs> These animals buzzed around my head in a perfectly alarming way, and an elderly sexton came up, asked whether perhaps he might be of assistance, to which I replied that would be an exceedingly kindly action, and touched my hat. <laughs> Hornets 
Uh, yes, Geraldine. Hesitation. Hesitation. I'm afraid there was a little hesitation there. Yes, you gain a point, Geraldine. And you have the sound of setting up a hornet's nest without saying the... and approximately 20 seconds to do so, starting from now. So rich is our language in imagery that I lived to a great age before I realised that hornets were in fact wasps. I had always assumed that stirring up a hornet's nest meant simply making trouble accidentally. <laughs> Fair Freud? Hesitation. Hesitation, yes, quite definitely. Hesitation there. You have one point for that, and you have now got about well, four seconds in which to discuss stirring up a hornet's nest without saying the starting from now. Which does mean making trouble to some extent, but not... <laughs> well, Clement, you're like a veritable greyhound in this race. <laughs> And you are still leading. Nicholas still second. Geraldine still third. So let's see if we can make any difference with this one. Geraldine, it's for you. Can you speak for 60 seconds about blamange? Blamange without saying A. A. The letter A is on the card, not E H. The letter A. You have 60 seconds starting from now. I have long cherished the ambition to make Blamange a sort of ammunition. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid you did say it. And Clement, I presume that was what your animals were about? Yes, it was. Yes, you win a point and you have the subject. Uh, you have to discuss, uh, you have 55 seconds to discuss Blamange without saying A starting from now. Blamange, I seem to recall, is the race that takes place in France. <laughs> Uh, Nicholas, why hesitation. You to, hesitation, yes, I'm afraid there was hesitation there. So Nicholas gains a point, and you have the sound of Nicholas. Blamange, without saying A, starting from now. Blamange was the most revolting matron I can ever remember. <laughs> <laughs> Geraldine? Hesitation. Hesitation. Ah, um, Monsieur William. Do the audience think he was hesitating? No, if you they... do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> now, come along. If you think he was hesitating, please say boo. <laughs> Oh, well, then, Geraldine, you win, well, you get the point. Well, say cheer. <laughs> As Geraldine gets the point, you have approximately 40 seconds, starting from now. There would be no deadlier weapon than Blamange. Imagine a fleet of jet... <laughs> Clement Roy, why are you challenging? Imagine a fleet. Imagine a fleet. That's quite true. You did say it, I'm afraid. <laughs> so you lose the subject. And it goes to you, Clement. Blamange, without saying a... You have about 35 seconds, starting from now. Blamange is the stickiest, ugliest, greasiest, most gelatinous substance in the... Uh, 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 yes, Nicholas, why... Repetition of adjectives. <laughs> well, it's obvious they're all on your side. <laughs> So you win the point. Nicola, point to Nicholas, and the subject goes to you, Blamange, without saying A, you have approximately 30 seconds, starting from now. This matron, Blamange, was at a boarding school. Geraldine? At a boarding school. Ah, uh, yes, I'm afraid you said A. You see, I, mean, I said I deliberately. You. you mustn't say A. <laughs> yes. So Geraldine gets a point, and it's you. your turn to speak about Blamange. You have approximately, what, 25 seconds. Blamange, without saying A, starting from now. Great fleets of bombers would rush out and drop vast quantities of blancmange on the luckless enemy. I don't think that any napalm could have such a devastating. Clement Freud. Such a devastating. A yes, there are. It was said again. You see, so it's Clement Freud's subject now. You for fifteen seconds, starting from now. Among other. <laughs> Geraldine, why did you challenge? It was a cheat, really. Among. No. <laughs> Quite um, unjustified. I don't think Ermang can ever be construed as Er. <laughs> no, I'm not having that. I thought I'm... it The challenge to the very basis of my authority, isn't it? Yes, yes no, eh? No. You get it back, Clement. You still have uh, 12 seconds in which to discuss Blumange without saying A, starting from now. This is, in many respects, the finest suite on a trolley. <laughs> Nicholas Parsons. On a trolley. Very well. You have to discuss Blamange, Nicholas. If seven seconds you have, starting from now. It is very difficult to discuss Blamange in seven seconds from now. Very difficult. Oh! <laughs> oh sorry. <laughs> oh, I was very worked up there myself. Mm. Oh, look, it's narrowing the gap. It's definitely... 
The gap is definitely narrowing. It's Nicholas creeping up on Clement Freud, so Clement will have to watch it, and Geraldine's still lagging a long way behind. So, the next one goes to you, Clement. You have 60 seconds in which to discuss yodeling without saying and, A-N-D. You mustn't say that at all. So, you have six seconds to discuss yodeling, starting from now. Yodeling is an art form for which I myself have very little time indeed. It is performed by elderly Swiss up mountains, which they achieve this noise, I mean to say, by... Uh, yes? Hesitation. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. Well, Geraldine, you get a point, and the subject goes to you, yodeling without saying and, about four or five seconds, starting from now. In my opinion, yodeling should never have been allowed to escape from the Alps, where there was a reasonable chance that very few people would ever hear the ghastly noise that yodelers make. Unfortunately, pop singers caught on to the idea that yodeling in a much adulterated form could make a nice record, and so they... Clement Freud, what's the base of your challenge? And... And, yes, you did say it, dear. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, you weren't very nice about yodeling. I do that in my bath. I thought that was very rude. So, you get the subject back, Clement. Yodeling without saying and. Uh, about 35 seconds you have, starting from now. I once did a programme on television with Frank Ifield when he spent most of the 28 minutes allocated to the production in producing this fearsome noise to the absolute horror... Geraldine, you're challenging? Hesitation. Hesitation. I didn't feel it. I didn't feel that. I didn't feel you really hesitating. Yeah. Well, so I'm afraid you lose that and you lose a point, I'm afraid, yes. And you gain a point, Clement, and you have left uh, five seconds in which to discuss yodeling without saying and starting from now. This is particularly exciting in the mountains of Lithuania when you... Half a second to go and you were challenged. Who was it challenged? Nicholas, you challenged. What was the basis Deviation. of Deviation. They do not yodel in the mountains of Lithuania. Oh. Oh, don't they? No. I didn't oh. say they did. He didn't say they did. <laughs> what did you say? In the mountains of Lithuania, Lithuania, you yes. hear very few yodelers. Ah, well, very valid. <laughs> if he had let me speak. Very valid point. <laughs> well, yes, it's a very valid point. It He's goes back... twisting you round oh, your no. rubber. No, I couldn't be. I'm a man of enormous integrity. I've got a great integrity. Yes, we get it back to Clement. You have half a second. And he's got an enormous score. Saying, and starting from now. Thank you. Yes, you've won again. Oh. Oh, yes. Well, Clement is fantastically in the lead. You've dropped again behind, I'm afraid, Nicholas. And Geraldine third. Now, this is one we can catch up, Geraldine. It's for you. You have 60 seconds in which to discuss... Applause, starting from now. Applause is really rather like money. It's much nicer to receive it than to give it. If you're sitting in the middle of an audience and you have to clap, the chances are that you'll feel your individuality slipping away from you. You're just one of a mass of ordinary people. If, on the other hand, you're on the stage and you're receiving the applause, you feel tremendously exhilarated. You think all these good people out there are clapping you, just you, and you can... <laughs> Oh, what a pity, Nicholas Reuse, Challenge. Reuse, you know. You, you, you. Yes, Repetition. you are right. I, mm. My sympathy, though, was engaged. Oh, I know my sympathy, but you see, Clement mm. Freud's still in the lead. I've got to fight. Yes, you, you have. You've got to fight. Yes, it's perfect. <laughs> you get one point, yes, and it's your subject, then. Your subject, applause, with 35 seconds starting from now. There are different kinds of applause. There is the slow hand clap, the fast hand clap. There's one that comes like a pistol shot, as usually somebody just swatting a fly. There are some that makes you sound as if a barber was stropping his razor. But of course applause basically comes from that old Latin one, plor and al. Now al was a very interesting chap in Roman times. He was the one who walked over the Alps with Hannibal and when he got to the top... Uh, Geraldine, why are you challenging? Deviation. He's talking about al plors, not applause. Yes, that's perfectly valid. Yes, absolutely valid point. You gain one point, Geraldine. The subject back to you, applause, with 12 seconds starting from now. The better the applause, the louder it is. It's nice, too, when people add to the clapping by standing up, even standing on their chairs, even standing on the backs of their chairs, in order yes, to... Yes, exactly. Well, our little lady won that round. I think that's really wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, and more power to your elbow, darling. Geraldine creeping up a little now, but Clement Freud, I'm afraid, still in the lead, and Nicholas still second. So we go to the next subject now, which is a Clement. Clement, will you talk for 60 seconds on annual reports, starting from now? Annual reports have an 
extraordinary tendency of coming once a year. <laughs> They're made by chairman or managing directors of companies at boring meetings where the news that are given them are only alleviated to some extent by the handing around of food and drink. Many of the food producing companies on the stock market have these annual meetings in hotels and shareholders only turn up to get a small parcel of goodies like <laughs> bacon, beer and fried potato crisps which they then take out. Ah, uh, yes, Nicholas. I don't the bacon, beer and potato crisps has got anything to do with the annual report. I consider that to be deviation. Yes, I'm afraid you're absolutely right and you gain a point and the subject is yours. Annual reports with 20 seconds starting from now. I'm sorry that you asked me to talk about annual reports because it is a very difficult subject. Oh, yes, Clement Freud, you're challenging? Deviation. Deviation, yes. It was his own fault. Quite so. It was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And, um, yes, and the subject goes back to you, Clement. So you have 20 seconds in which to discuss annual reports starting from now. Because the financial year finishes in April, annual reports tend to take place in the early months of the year so that the budget can take into account... Geraldine? Hesitation. Hesitation. Yes, there was a little hesitation there. You gain one point, <laughs> and the subject is yours. You approximately have eight seconds to discuss annual reports starting from now. The only possible way to make annual reports interesting is to invent them. There is nothing more fun than sitting at a committee meeting when you know that all the people present have been present at the meeting. Oh, and you've won that round. <laughs> Oh, well, this is fantastic. You're really creeping up, darling. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. You're level now with Nicholas Parsons. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> yes. So both of you are mouse behind Clement. <laughs> mm. Next one is... Oh, no, that's the end, isn't it? Oh, that's the end. We can't have any more. No, so that's the end, I'm afraid, of... Wait a minute. And we'll be back... A step. What's that? Deviation is called just a minute, not wait a minute. Oh, is it? <laughs> The chairman of Just a Minute this week was Kenneth Williams. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatt. Present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud and Geraldine Jones in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is this week's chairman, Nicholas Parsons. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed and welcome once again to Just a Minute. May I just remind you, for those who may not have heard the programme before the rules, I'm going to give these three people on the panel some unlikely subject to talk about, which they know nothing about. They must then try and speak for 60 seconds without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviating from the subject. If one of the other two think that they are guilty of this crime, they may challenge them, and if I uphold their challenge, they will gain a point, and if the challenge goes against them, the person who's speaking will gain a point. I think the rest of the points will become clear as we go along, so let us start straight off with Kenneth Williams. Can you talk for just a minute on winter woolies? <laughs> Starting now. Winter Woolies uh, got this name because, of course, of the action of Monty Woolley, who used to come on, no, he used to come on dressed in this red flannelette in The Man Who Came to Dinner. Not to be confused with Monty the General, of course, who, when he arrived in his BVDs in Chongqing, found this old Chinaman who dropped dead at his feet, and he said, is this the usual customary greeting here, or are they suffering from malnutrition? And they said, no, it's because he sang, come into the garden, Lord, for the black bat night has flown. And she opened that dedicated... <laughs> 
Ace of Creatures Parkers, wear the wax or stuffy either ear drobe in order to pass the siren safely. Which brings, of course, to Cinderella, who sat by the embers of the fire because she hadn't remembered to put her winter underwear on, you see. And this old witch came in, which is part of the siren business, and she said she'd give her three wishes and your pumpkin turns into a cabbage or a load of rats, you know, as the case may be. And the prince said, anyone who fits that Wellington boot on their feet will be my wife. Well, she cried, joy in the eyeball, joy to behold, and I can't really think... Oh. <laughs> That's the first time for a very long time that anybody has actually managed to speak for just a minute without being interrupted. <laughs> Nearly all of it was completely irrelevant to Winter <laughs> Woolies, but it was a magnificent effort, and I'm going to award Kenneth Williams a bonus point. So oh, you start off with thank two. Thank you very right much. Away, Kenneth. <laughs> bonus points, not to be right sniffed away. at. <laughs> Right, uh, Geraldine, your chance to try and defeat the inimitable Kenneth. Geraldine Jones, will you talk for just a minute on impressing strangers starting now? The best strangers to impress are those you meet in railway carriages, preferably first-class ones, because you meet a better type of sex maniac in them. <laughs> I always like to... Uh, Kenneth Williams, oh, what I'm is sorry, your challenge? Yes, why, we don't want a load of filth on the show. <laughs> I mean, what's it got to do with sex maniacs? Wait Kenneth and Williams, see. Kenneth, we do not want a load of filth on this programme. Will you please keep quiet and let... <laughs> and let Geraldine Jones continue with her subject. Uh, Geraldine, <laughs> you have 49 and a half seconds left to discuss impressing strangers. Uh, starting now. The nicest thing about this is that you can pretend to be somebody completely different from who you really are. I always like to impress strangers that I am a spy, and for this reason I always travel on trains wearing dark glasses and an astrakhan collar. I also undo the heel of my shoe from time to time and extract little things that look like tiny microfilms. Everyone in the compartment looks at me very strangely, and, and I sort of sniff and impress them that I, I'm a sort of female James... <laughs> Kenneth Williams. Hesitation. Yes, I think this mm. time she was. She was Undoubtedly, she was hesitating all the time. Mm. You have another point for that, and you have the subject of impressing strangers, Kenneth, starting now. Well, of course, the first thing to do is to behave with an air of confidence. The moment you walk into the room, you must appear to know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> if you don't come in with that impression, they will think, oh, he don't know what he's doing. And, of course, thereafter, you don't stand a chance about impressing them. The first thing we all want to do when we come into a room is to be liked. I mean, none of us want people to, to give us the cold shoulder, do we? So we all become very nice, very happy, very... <laughs> Kenneth, it's your day. You're playing the game with a flamboyance that ill becomes yes. you. Yes, I don't know what's come over me. <laughs> Well, anyway, you've taken a commanding lead, and uh, Geraldine has uh, got a point. Clement has yet to score, but... Um, I have yet to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Look, don't worry. He can come from behind and win convincingly if you're not careful. So, Clement Freud, it is your turn to speak, and no doubt win some points, and a subject which um, I'm sure you can discourse on at great length, but just 60 seconds will do. Matches, starting now. Matches also tend to be contests between people, teams, clubs, universities or institutions. But perhaps in the first instance the general public will think of this word in the context of pieces of wood which have a sulfuric adhesive at one end which is struck against emery paper or similar substance. <laughs> Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. I think you're right. Yes, Geraldine, you have a point. You have the subject. You have 20, 36 seconds, and the subject is matches starting now. Matches offer an enormous amount of entertainment. Whether you're making matches between your friends and hoping that X will marry Y if you can only bring them together at a suitable <coughs> moment. Uh, Ken, uh, Clement Freud. That's devious. X marrying Y. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Best friends. <laughs> Uh, Geraldine, Geraldine, uh, it sounds uh, very nasty, but can you qualify to make it not sound nasty for us? Well, I... I in, in, in about two sentences, very rapidly. I don't like to say too much about these friends of mine, then but I can assure devious. you that it's they do exist. Devious. Yes, it's devious. You have a point, and you have... Um, how many seconds? You have uh, 27 seconds for matches, and you start now. Matches are not essential because it is believed that if you rub two Boy Scouts together, <laughs> a similar sort of thing will happen. Geraldine... 
deviation is yes. not matched. If your X and Y was devious, by golly, those Boy Scouts are devious. <laughs> My goodness me. You have a point. You have the subject bad, Geraldine. You have 18 seconds. It is matches starting now. They also make wonderful toys for very fidgety people like me. You can take a box of matches, build them into houses, strike them against each other, see if you can strike a match and hold it at the other end so that it burns along the whole way and you get a nice little black bit that doesn't look at all like the original thing you started with. You can... For any listeners who may not have established our scoring system from the what's been going on, when the bell goes, whoever's speaking gains another point. Geraldine was speaking then, so she is now equal in the lead with Kenneth Williams, and Clement Freud is trailing somewhat. <laughs> Kenneth Williams, it is your turn to begin. <laughs> oh, Kenneth, after your performance in the first one, what a subject. Ian Mester's thought off for this one for you. Grand, I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> Grandiloquence. Oh. I'll give you a second to think about it. No, I'm all right. Oh, you're all right, are you? Mm. Grand eloquence, starting now. Well, of course, this is taken, I think, generally to mean over-ornamentation in speech, rather like the St Pancras station. And we're told, of course, that the architect of that cried his eyes out when it was opened and he said, Oh, it's too lovely, it's too lovely. And indeed, crying brings us back to grand eloquence. Shakespeare himself says, speak the speech I pray you, as I pronounce it, do you trip it on the tongue or do not mouth it as some of your... <laughs> Geraldine Jones. Deviation. Why? Well, I, I think that if we'd let him finish this speech, it would have been over the minute, and we would have got what is not grandiloquence rather than what is. Well, Geraldine, you're completely oh, wrong. He hasn't even gone half a minute yet. He's no expression of grandiloquence, and I felt that Shakespeare probably was quite a good example of it. So, Kenneth, I'm still with you. You still have grandiloquence, and you have... 36 seconds and you start now. Well, another example of it would, I suppose, be summed up by Disraeli's remark about the man who was indulging in it to excess when he said... <laughs> when he said... In grandiloquence, I mean. He said, he said the gentleman is overcome by the exuberance. Repetition. He Repetition. said, he said, he said. He well, said. I had to, dearie. I mean, it was uh, to underline the point. Actually, this is one of those difficult situations. I do think that Kenneth was trying to illustrate his point. And yet he... <laughs> repetitive <laughs> Repetition. His point was somewhat devious, I thought. But Geraldine has challenged on repetition. Now, I'm going to put it quite clearly to this delightful-looking audience here. If you think that Geraldine's challenge was justified, will you please cheer? If you think it was unjustified, will you boo? And will you all do it now? <laughs> Kenneth, there with you. Yes. <laughs> You have another point. You're well in the lead as well. You have 23 seconds. You have grandiloquence and you start now. Well, you see, Disraeli did say about this, the gentleman was overcome by the exuberance of his own verbosity. And that, I think, would be... Clement Freud. Repetition. Disraeli said that. You accusing him of repetition of Disraeli? Yes. Shut up, Kenneth Williams. I haven't said nothing. You said quite enough. You are playing to the audience. Clement Freud is trailing for once, and he'll probably soon catch up. Watch out. He has the subject of grandiloquence. Clement, you have 14 seconds, and you start now. Grandiloquence means talking rather like Kenneth Williams, only more so. <laughs> it's a fine, noble, and upstanding way of speaking and impressing people at the same time who look up to the speaker saying, Oh, he won. Well, Clement Freud is catching up on Geraldine Jones, who is catching up on Kenneth Williams, but Kenneth is not going to be caught up. He's still in the lead. Clement Freud, it is your turn to start, and the subject is the art of letter writing, and you have 60 seconds starting now. The art of letter writing is generally attained by the use of a pen, a pencil, or some other instrument, which, when pressed onto a piece of paper, leaves a mark of some kind. Many letters begin with such good phrases as my husband and I, or just dear Charlie, thank you very much indeed. And these pieces of paper are then put into an envelope which is sealed by licking the adhesive substance on the envelope. Geraldine Jones. Deviation. Why? Well, these, these are the, the rather crude mechanics of putting paper in envelopes, nothing to do with the art of letter writing, I composition. I quite agree, actually. Putting on letters into envelopes has nothing to do with the art of letter writing. That's what you were trying to say, isn't it? That's what I thought I said. <laughs> Uh, 
Geraldine, do you want two points? <laughs> I'll give you one and the subject and 30 seconds for the art of letter writing starting now. I have developed the art of letter writing over a long and difficult period. You need to write an awful lot of letters before you feel that every piece of composition that you write has that unmistakable ring that you, the, the, the great Geraldine Jones. Uh, Clement Freud. Hesitation. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, Clement, you have another point. You have the art of letter writing starting... Oh, and the time. You have 16 and a half seconds starting now. The most truly artistic letter I've ever received did come from Miss, Ge Miss Geraldine Jones, who wrote to me from the Oxford Union, and the letter was one of such artistry that I shall now recite it in full. Dear Mr. Freud, I would like you very much. This was duplicated. Williams, it is your turn to begin. Oh, first of all, there's a penalty they're going to in inflict on you this time. Oh, I hate them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a simple one. It's a collective one. They, the word they. You mustn't say the word they. The subject is bird watching. <laughs> you thought about it for a second. I think it's only fair when you have to leave out the word they. You have 60 seconds starting now. Well, of course, you do need your hollow trunk. You must have a hollow trunk and you get inside it and you stick all these twigs and leaves onto your ear and all over your arms so that you do look like a tree and then possibly the birds will come right close to you. It's no good putting a load of snakes in your ear like Medusa because birds don't go for snakes apart from eagles and eagles aren't very often seen in England anyway. I mean, that one got out of the zoo the other day and all those birds, you know, got rushing... <laughs> Geraldine Jones. Is um, it just getting Hesitation. hesitation. Geraldine, you have a point. You have 29 seconds for bird watching. No, they starting now. I have no interest in looking at the feathered birds that Kenneth Williams has been talking about. Equally, I think I would be accused of deviation if I claimed to do any of the bird watching that is vulgarly known in Cockney language as looking at women. So I suppose I must just talk about something that I don't really know anything about. If you're watching birds, apart from all the camouflage that, that the more sophisticated bird uh, watchers... Clement Fry. Hesitation. Uh, yes, yeah, definite. Oh, definite. <laughs> oh. Well, I that actually that. thought it was, but I'll tell you my definitely, I think it was, but there seems to be such a, a vociferous audience here who want to make their feelings felt. I will give them a chance to do it again. If you think that she was hesitating, will you please cheer? If you think she wasn't hesitating, boo. And will you all do it now? <laughs> She was not hesitating, Clement Freud. The audiences are the final judge. Geraldine Jones, you have another point. You have seven seconds. You have bird watching. No, they starting now. Only flamboyant people like Kenneth Williams need to dress up in twigs to watch birds. <laughs> Deviation. Kenneth Williams, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. The subject is bird watching. It's not me dressing up in twigs. <laughs> I think the idea of you dressing up in twigs is very devious. I quite agree. I agree. Thank Ken you. Kenneth, you have the subject. And here we go, fellow. You have two seconds for bird watching starting now. Well, in winter, you get the blue tits, of course, and they're very. <laughs> Kenneth Williams, with that last remark of his, believe it or not, <laughs> not only gained an extra point, he crept into second place alongside Geraldine Jones, who are both just about one point behind. Uh, uh, Clement Freud. Geraldine, it is your turn to begin, and we're having another penalty on this round. The penalty is the word I. You mustn't say I in anywhere at all. The subject is humbugs. Give you a second to think about it. Humbug, 60 seconds, starting now. It's extremely difficult for egocentric people like me to talk about anything without using the word that is vetoed in this game. Humbugs, I think, are mainly... <laughs> Clement Freud. I, I think, yeah. Clement Freud, yes, you have a point, you have 51 seconds for humbugs, no I, starting now. Humbugs are delicate sweets made of spun sugar, flavoured, as often as not, with mint. <coughs> Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. Hesitation, you are right, you have another point, you have 43 seconds, humbugs, no I, starting now. Humbugs can also be people. The sort of people that end up in Parliament saying things that they don't really mean, saying things that sound good but in fact are, are very specious indeed. The humbugs that... Uh, Kenneth Williams, hesitation. hesitation, you have a point, you have the subject. 30 seconds, 
Humbugs, no I, starting now. Humbugs are people, who, of course, who continually indulge in bigotry. They're always to be found with prejudices and nasty theories of their own, which they wish to impose on everyone else, and they're to be avoided, avoided like the plague, <laughs> like a load of locusts in society. And I, for one, believe in the little... <laughs> Clement Freud, you have another point. I don't need to ask you what it was for. You have 14 seconds starting now. Kenneth Williams, as he has so rightly said, is not a humbug because this sort of person <laughs> is a phony, a difficult and complicated politician who speaks words that he doesn't mean. Geraldine Jones. Repetition. We've had this idea three times. I don't think within the Kant rules of the game he really was. He has another point with two seconds to go for humbugs with no I starting now. Most good sweet shops sell these. Well, from the listener's point of view, the interesting point of view is the Geraldine Hatton challenge there. Probably the scores would be equal, but it does mean that Clement is, Freud is now in the lead with Geraldine Jones and Kenneth Williams equal second still. Uh, Clement Freud, it is your turn to begin, a subject which I feel that you can talk about with uh, some authority, we hope so, but just 60 seconds will do. The opposite sex... Oh, and haven't given you the subject, think about it for a second, because we're going to have a real penalty this time. You mustn't say either the word he or she. <laughs> in talking about the opposite sex for 60 seconds, starting now. I always refer to the opposite sex as it. I find that people <laughs> prefer this to the definite article and are immensely flattered, especially when they come into a room and you turn to your guests and say, I can't remember its name, but it last came into this room wearing a skirt or a dress or a coat. And... Geraldine <laughs> Jones. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. We didn't know what that it was doing, did we? Um, right, Geraldine, uh, there are 40, no, there are 37 seconds left for the opposite sex without mentioning he or she starting now. It is, of course, perfectly logical for the opposite sex to all us human beings to be called it, but it makes it much... <laughs> Clement Freud. Hesitation. Hesitation, <laughs> yes. Clement, you have another point. You have the subject back for 30 seconds. The opposite sex, no he or she, starting now. From my own point of view, this, of course, refers to women who are the best possible opposite sex for a man. <laughs> women are lovely, fat, blousy, bumptious creatures who creep into one's life full of little sayings that are endearing and homely and kindly and make one feel warm and comfortable and wanted. Women are easily distinguishable. Uh, Geraldine Jones. A plethora of women. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a clever challenge. Yes. Ah. yes, I think it was a very clever challenge because there were a lot of women going around here. You're quite right. And so we have a repetition of women, if not spoken, certainly by implication. And so, Geraldine, you have a point, you have the subject, and if I favoured you, probably it's fair because Clement's in a commanding lead. You have six seconds left for the opposite sex, no he's or she's, starting now. I dislike the phrase opposite sex because it has a sort of circumlocution about it. You feel that when people talk... Clement Freud, shout no. Clement, you clouded just before it. Hesitation. No, I'm sorry, there was no hesitation. Geraldine has another point. She has one second left for the subject of the opposite sex. No, he or she is starting now. People who talk about so it. So she has another point. <laughs> well, Geraldine, you have now managed to creep in to an equal lead with Clement Freud, and Kenneth Williams is, alas, trailing a little behind. <laughs> and if you've never seen Kenneth Williams trailing a little behind, you haven't missed anything. <laughs> Kenneth... It's your turn to begin. Something we hope that you can tell us a great deal about, in which 60 seconds, English slang, starting now. This is not something I'm really very qualified to discuss because slang is, of course, born of laziness in speech and is generally used by people without a very large vocabulary. My vocabulary is very extensive indeed. <laughs> But I suppose a good example of slang would be that Cockney rhyming um, practice whereby they say apples and pears for stairs and shout nolla for collar and north and south for mouth. I believe this is a common parlance among Cockneys and they say what you got in your north when they mean, of course, in your mouth. And they also say are you going up the apples when, of course, they really mean the stairs. <laughs> Uh, Clement Freud. We've had that once. <laughs> Repetition. Yes, we've only had it once, though. I think within the context of the game, I think he... No, can... he's quite right. He's absolutely he? right. He's perfect. Right. Do you want to give it to him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, Kenneth, you're so generous. Clem <laughs> Kenneth Williams has given Clement Freud a point and, of course, the subject, which he obviously didn't want. <laughs> and 19 seconds, Clement Freud for English slang starting now. Perhaps the most endearing form of English slang, as Kenneth Williams so eruditely pointed out, is rhyming slang, in which measure of speech I would like to commend to your attention, happies. Now, happies is rhyming slang for flowers, coming from happy half... Uh, Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. Yes, I think there was just a mild hesitation there. With uh, only two seconds left, you have English slang starting now. Contrary to what? Clement Freud. Hesitation. Hesitation. Yes, hesitation. No. Clement Freud, you have the subject back. You have uh, one second for English slang, slang starting... Slang? Slang. <laughs> Put your thumb oh, on I'm your sorry, buzzer. I'm sorry, that was slang. Yes, I mean... Kenneth Williams, it's your chance. Put your finger on your buzzer. Clement Freud, you have one second left for English slang starting now. Any form of speech is... <laughs> <laughs> well, De uh, Clement Freud has taken a minute lead from Geraldine Jones and Kenneth Williams is still a last trailing. A little, but only a little. Geraldine, it's your turn to begin. Geraldine Jones, the subject is brewing. For 60 seconds, can you think? I'll give you a second. You've gone so wide-eyed with amazement. Brewing. It's rather a male subject, isn't it? But anyway, start now. Brewing tea is something I can do. Brewing beer is something I couldn't possibly do. I wouldn't really want to be able to brew beer because I think it's a rather revolting drink. Tea, on the other hand, usually gets worse the longer you brew it. It goes stale and horrible and smells. It goes darker in colour. It generally... <laughs> <laughs> this is a form of sadism on the part of the other two players of this game. <laughs> uh, Clement Freud. Deviation. <laughs> she was not deviating. Sadism has nothing to do with brewing. <laughs> I think Geraldine Jones was not committing any crime. She was being intimidated. Geraldine, the subject is still yours. <laughs> And you'll have 24 <laughs> seconds left for brewing. And another point starts. <laughs> it's extremely difficult to talk about brewing when you're rendered in some, unable to speak by giggles, which are produced by the sadistic onslaught of the two men on either side who want to hear you make a fool of yourself talking about your ignorance on a subject like brewing. Brewing is extremely complicated. Clement Freud. Repetition. Of, what? <laughs> of brewing, yes. She has brewed up quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> So, Clement Freud, you have another point. You have the subject of brewing, and uh, you have um, seven seconds, eight seconds left, starting now. Brewing is something that takes time. In the case of beer, it means the betterment of the product by letting it rest. Well, that, alas, is all we have time for in just a minute. Uh, Kenneth Williams was just behind Geraldine Jones, who was just a little way behind Clement Freud, who was this week's winner. The chairman of Just a Minute this week was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud and Geraldine Jones in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is this week's chairman, Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed and welcome once again to just a minute. And um, need I remind you of the rules? Perhaps I should remind myself. They're going to try and speak, each one of them, for just a minute on some unlikely subject which I will give them without hesitation, without repetition, and without deviation. And if either of the other two think the third one is guilty of this crime, they may challenge and so gain points for themselves or otherwise, which I'm sure will become clear as we proceed. Geraldine, it is your turn to begin, and for that fine academic mind of yours, Pythagoras. What about that for a good subject for you? And would you start talking now? 
Pythagoras was an or rather ordinary Greek who lived a long time ago. Apart from this, though, he and I do have one thing in common. We both doodle. While I throw all my doodles modestly away, however, he kept his, and among them was a lot of doodling with a triangle. Among this, scholars in subsequent ages have discovered various things about triangles which strike me as the most incredibly irrelevant and boring facts. It's odd enough that you should want to investigate a triangle at all, but even supposing that you do, then to investigate how many squares it can have on each of its <coughs> sides... Uh, Clement Roy, do you challenge why? Deviation. Why? Squares on a triangle. Geraldine, would you like to qualify what you're going to say in a half a sentence or one sentence? It's Pythagoras's idea. It's all I know about him. Ah, you don't know enough, I think, to get came to a point so clear. No, I think she ought to. It's quite right, because Pythagoras talked. You repeat yeah, the square and the hypotenuse yes, is equal to the sum right, of squares yes, on the other two sides. A, yes, so... She, but I thought Geraldine was... didn't know that, so I was going to give the point to you. But I thought perhaps she didn't know. <laughs> but you... <laughs> <laughs> Ken like Freud, you're very magnanimous. You challenge to get points and then you give them back to the person you challenge. What a magnificent gesture. All right. <laughs> Geraldine, Clement Freud's given you a point and you have still 27 seconds for Pythagoras starting now. I now know that the sum of the squares on the hypotenuse, thanks to Clement Freud and Nicholas Parsons, equals... Uh, Clement Freud. Deviation. Why? Why? Because it's not the sum of the squares on the hypotenuse, it's the sum of the, squ- <laughs> it's quite the, right. sum of the squares on the other two sides. That's right. Yeah. The square and the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares on the two sides. Clement Freud, you have uh, 22 seconds for Pythagoras starting now. Pythagoras was very happily married to an elderly woman known as Blueberry Pie around <laughs> that part of Greece. And Pythagoras and Blueberry raised many children who were famous in their own fields of geometry and pure arithmetic and kept algebra entirely out of it. Thank you. Geraldine Jones, why did you challenge? Hesitation. Yes, I think so. I'm surprised you didn't challenge before. You have Pythagoras back for two seconds, Geraldine, starting now. Pythagoras was Clement a... Freud, you challenged. Hesitation. Hesitation. You have another... <laughs> you have one second, Clement Freud, for Pythagoras starting now. It's equal to... Uh, Geraldine Jones, Ooh. she was in. Hesitation. Hesitation, of course, you're absolutely right. Yes, you have half a second, <laughs> Geraldine, for Pythagoras starting now. He was a terribly sadistic... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Ian Messiter, who was sitting beside me, managed to avoid there. So Geraldine gets the point. She gets an extra point for speaking as the buzzer went. So, <laughs> well, Clement Freud is now a little in the lead. One point behind is Geraldine Jones, and one point behind that is Kenneth Williams. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. A subject that um, we hope that you can talk to us about: making a cup of tea. Can you discuss that in sixty seconds, starting now? Making a cup of tea is rather more difficult than making a pot of tea, but I will try to answer the question that you gave me. Perhaps slightly deviously, but we shall see. You get a cup and ideally warm it and put into the cup tea leaves, which should... Oh, <laughs> Geraldine Jones, yes. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. He was trying to be so clever in, ma- in taking the subject too literally, which I thought was a great effort. Anyway, you have a point, Geraldine. You have 40 seconds for making a cup of tea starting now. As a patriotic Englishwoman, it's very difficult to talk about making a cup of tea because the only people who make cups of tea are foreigners, people who dangle tea bags in a cup of hot water and produce a rather revolting, insipid brew, which generally doesn't taste awfully nice with milk. This reminds me, of course, of brewing, but I shall... Clement Freud. Deviation. Why? It reminds of brewing. We're talking about cups of tea. Well, you but brew as you could also tea. brew tea, I think it's not justified. But Geraldine, you have another point. You have 22 seconds for making a cup of tea starting now. It's no use really letting a cup of tea stand in order to... Uh, Clement Freud. Repetition. Uh, Seven cups. Yeah. <laughs> There's certainly a lot of cups of tea. Clement, you have another point and you have 20 seconds for making a cup of tea starting now. If to be reminded of brewing is not deviation, a cup of tea reminds me of flying. You sit <laughs> in a seat and you pull forward the propeller lever. Clement, uh, De- Kenneth Williams, lovely to hear from you. Well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've been so nice to each other. I'm bemused, dear, I am. Deviation, well, of course, sitting in for aeroplanes has nothing to do with, with discussing making a cup of tea. Deviation. Ke- do you wish to justify it very rapidly, Clement? Can you, in one sentence? What no, do you I'd, I'd like to hear Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Thank you, Overstand. You have ten seconds, Kenneth, and you have another point, of course. You have making a cup of tea, and you start now. Tea, of course, as everyone knows, is grown on the Chiltern and Cotswold Hills. (laughs) 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 (laughs)
not grown on the Chilterns. <laughs> Half a point each, you have to stick by. Right, a half point each, so we're still with you, uh, Kenneth, with five seconds to go. Make a cup of tea starting now. And these girls pick this tea and they're dressed in gay bandanas which they wrap round their heads and they cry <laughs> out. <laughs> and they... Oh, tell me I've leapt into the lead. <laughs> no. You leapt all but into the lead. Well, you are about half a point behind Geraldine, who is half a point behind Clement Freud. No. It's... <laughs> it's neck and neck. And, Kenneth Williams, it is your turn to begin with the delightful subject, proposals. 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. Proposals. The word, of course, is derived from pro, which is to be for something, and pose, which is, of course, to pretend to be something you're not. Many, pe <laughs> many people connect it with marriage, which, of course, would fulfil that definition, because many people would wish they hadn't got the one they were stuck with. <laughs> In a sense, that makes sense. On the other hand, a lady once told me that she was proposed to by a carrier pigeon. And she, yes, she said she was there in her garden waiting for her message, watching the birds wheeling and turning. And a neighbour said, what are you doing? She said, I'm waiting for it. And she said... She said... <laughs> said oh, dear, I think you're asking for it. <laughs> Clement Freud. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. No, I was... no, no, no. You can oh, embroider to us. I can go with you to a certain extent when on I your get embroidery. Up, I often throb a bit. Yes. <laughs> you were throbbing too much. I, I said I can go with you to a certain extent on your embroidery, Kenneth, but I think you went a little far on this occasion, so Clement Freud has an extra point. He has 16 seconds for proposal starting now. The normal method of proposing to a young woman whom you want to take as your wife is to approach her father and ask him whether you can have her hand in matrimony. This is ideally done by getting down on one knee, which you will later do to the girl in question, and saying, Sir, you always want... I would have thought that was rather devious, saying to the girl in question, Sir, but still, <laughs> Clement Freud, as you were speaking as the bell went... <laughs> Uh, you have taken a good lead, I would say, yes. And Geraldine is still be a little behind you, and Kenneth is half a point behind Geraldine. Geraldine, a subject for you now. Spooks. Would you try and talk for just a minute, starting now? Spooks' his Christian name was Jim. He was a very tall, thin young man who used to drink vast quantities of whiskey and brandy, and because all the people he associated with were high-powered, dynamic wits, they used to make lots of puns on his name and call him Spirits for short. Of course, he used to also live in a... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Hesitation. Hesitation, I agree. You have another point, Kenneth. You have 48 seconds for... No, less than... No, 40, no 43 seconds for spooks starting now. This is, of course, the plural form of to cock a snook, which means to act derisively with the form of gesture. Uh, Geraldine Jones. Regrettably deviation. <laughs> uh, yes, would you justify it, just for the audience? It was snooks instead of spooks with yes. a P. Yes, I mean, it's spooks. Oh, your dick... Is grateful. <laughs> However bad my diction may be, if you'd been listening to Geraldine Jones at all attentively, <laughs> you'd have realised that she was on about spirits and such like. But I'm concentrating on whether she hesitates or not. How can I think of both things at once? I think you're emotionally thinking of cocking a snook. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So, Geraldine Jones has another point. She has the subject back with 34 seconds left for spooks, starting now. Spooks always strikes me as a terribly metallic, angular <laughs> word. Uh, Clement Freud, why do you challenge? You pressed your buzzer. <laughs> do you wish to retract your... your... Yes, it was a, a <laughs> thumb slip. <laughs> and what we have before described as one of those Freudian slips. <laughs> right. <laughs> Back with you, Geraldine, and no points lost, but next time I will have to penalise for 29 seconds for spooks starting now. It was, in fact, one of the spooks I'm talking about that pressed Clement Freud's buzzer just now. They behave in, in a rather... 
Uh, Clement Roy. Hesitation. Yes, this time you're right. You have a point, Clement, and you have um, 21 seconds for spooks starting now. Rudyard Kipling was very impressed with this subject and wrote a poem which began spooks, 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 moving up and down again, and later decided... <laughs> Kenneth Williams. Completely untrue, it's deviation. It was boots, 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 the <laughs> Nothing to do with spooks. I thought you were going to have them for repetition. We had about seven spooks. Oh, yes, spooks. that should have been repetition yeah. as well. Yes, that's another thing. <laughs> yes, that should get me two points. <laughs> um... Ian Messito sitting beside me thinks you should. I don't know why. I don't think so. No, I think I... No, actually, um, I'm not know that Roger Kipping one day didn't write down uh, spooks, 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 spooks. Yeah, so well, I know what did, I'll do. It's not been published, Ducky. No, as you didn't challenge correctly, I will give you one point, but I will give the subject back to Clement Freud. Uh, Clement, you have nine seconds for spooks starting now. On a dark, wet August night, this is the sort of thing you're likely to see in the belfry of any provincial church. It comes up wet <laughs> and... I think Geraldine's challenge came in just beforehand, didn't it? A split second. A split second. All right, Geraldine, what is your challenge? Deviation. We don't know what he was talking about, unless Kipling appears in the belfry. <laughs> oh, I think you're all trying to be too clever now. No, no, I won't ground that. But as you buzz, as the buzzer went, Clement just gets one point for speaking as the buzzer went. He's got his round of applause, and he's definitely in the lead. And one point behind is Kenneth Williams, and one point behind is Geraldine Jones. Clement Freud, it is now your turn to begin. You have the weather. And anybody can talk about that in this country for considerable time, but just a minute will do, starting now. There's an awful lot of weather in this country. <laughs> and you mostly get it above the ground, often as high up as in the sky. It rains and it snows and sometimes it thunders. It's a very handsome subject with which to meet people. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. Weather can't be called handsome. It might be applied to a man. It might be applied to me. <laughs> You know, many people have said it of me, but uh, you couldn't say the weather was handsome, no. You couldn't? No. I tell you what we'll do, to put it to the audience once again, do you think that Kenneth Williams' um, challenge was justified? And if you do, will you cheer? If you think it was unjustified, will you boo? And will you all do it now? <laughs> it, I don't know if it's easy to chew that boo, I don't know, but there's certainly with you, Kenneth Williams, you have another point and you have 40... Uh, three seconds for the weather starting now. Well, weather, of course, can be delightful, and I always go off to the east for the for the sunshine, you see, because you do get the sunshine leaves, which you can never get here. And I lay out there with my tan oil, and I rub it on, rub it all over myself. Really luxurious. Uh, Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. <laughs> No, I would have had it for deviation, because I don't see what tan, tan oil is, you know, I think it's getting really devious. No, Kenneth Williams has uh, 26 seconds for the weather starting now. And indeed, I have had such a tan that I've been sometimes compared with Morocco leather. You've all seen those Morocco leather poofs. Uh, Geraldine Jones. Deviation. <laughs> definitely, I won't go any further. One definite deviation and one point to you, Geraldine. And with 18 seconds for the weather, you start now. I am the tainted weather of the flock is a line in Shakespeare which I've never been able to make out. It seems incredible that weather, which we all know is the only subject of conversation for those who don't like talking, it can be connected. Uh, Clement Freud. Hesitation. Hesitation. You have another point, Clement. You have six seconds for the weather starting now. Snowing is quite an interesting aspect of weather, and it usually happens in winter when the day is cold. And... <laughs> Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. And I think it's about time we had a penalty. So on this round, we'll have a penalty. You mustn't mention the word two. That includes T-O, T-double-O, or T-W-O. The subject is relations. And you start now. Relations? Well, of course, this generally refers to public... Uh, <laughs> Kenneth said two. You have another point. You have 54 seconds for relations starting now. I have relations in two law. <laughs> Geraldine Jones? Two. Uh, Clement Freud, what were you going to say? I think I know. I said I have relations in two law. Yes, you're quite right. So That's sorry. I, I... <laughs> so, Clement Freud cleverly has another point. He has uh, 52 seconds for relations 
starting now. While a middle-aged aunt of mine lives in Tewkesbury, <laughs> I visit her usually on Tuesdays when we go... <laughs> Geraldine Jones. Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. Hesitation, you're correct. You have another point. You have 43 seconds for relations starting now. Relations are a nice composite term for all those people in your family that you don't know awfully well. The sort of aunts and cousins and sisters, not sisters really, sisters, relations perhaps, in-laws and cousins. Uh, Clement Freud. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. Clement, you have another point. You have 30 seconds for relations and none of the penalties. Two, 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 starting now. Tombs are beautiful places in which one finds these people. Aunts, sisters, uncles, grandfathers and grandmothers, all of these apply under the term relations. And a relationship is a sort of boat with which one goes and sees... Geraldine Jones. Deviation. Why? Well, we're on to relationships. That's Out a very relations. clever challenge. I would have had him for hesitation. I was already getting down so slowly. I didn't go any slower, actually. But, all right, a clever challenge, uh, Geraldine. You have another point. You have nine seconds for relations starting now. Relations, of course, don't have to apply to people. Uh, Clement Freud. To apply. Very good. Clement Freud, you have another point, and you have the subject back with seven seconds to go starting now. A second cousin twice removed is the sort of... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation. He mentioned cousins before. We had him about eight cousins before. We haven't had a single second cousin. We haven't had a second cousin. I think we've only had cousins once in any relationship, so well, I'm I afraid... I've spoken for ages. <laughs> Baby, you're limited on relations, Kenneth. Anyway, uh, I'm afraid, Kenneth, you have given Clement Freud another point. With three seconds to go for relations, Clement, starting now. And a lukewarm case could be made for a mother-in-law. Well, Clement, with all his relations, uh, has taken a definite lead and equal second are Geraldine Jones and Kenneth Williams. Perhaps the balance can be redressed this time by Geraldine Jones. A subject... Oh, we'll have another penalty, this one, too. Without saying the word of, O-F. And the subject is getting a break. A little second to think about it and start now. Naturally, the best place to go to get a break is Oxford. You find the ideal situation for this in a little shop in a little back street where a nice man has a great selection of boxes in which... Uh, Clement Freud. Of boxes. Of boxes. You're right. You have a point, Clement. You have getting a Wha break starting now. The best time to get a break is when you're particularly hungry, when you can go to a shop and purchase something which will make you less hungry, like a large bar coated with chocolate or a small piece of chocolate with some bar outside it. In the schools, there is a break at about half an hour before... Uh, Geraldine Jones. Hesitation. Yes, I definitely I think so. Uh, Geraldine, you have the subject back with another point. You have 25 seconds for getting a break, not saying the word of, starting now. This is terribly difficult because breaks are normally hidden in things like cars or bicycles. And when you only have to get a break by itself, it's extremely hard to distinguish. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Yes. Uh, sorry, hesitation. Hesitation, yes. Mm. Kenneth, you have another point. You have 15 seconds for getting a break without saying the word of, starting now. Well, I got a break on the football field. Actually, I was doing an impersonation of Winston Churchill and somebody rushed up and they from. bashed me right across the... <laughs> Clement Freud, you challenge why? Of Winston Churchill. Of Winston Churchill, I'm oh, afraid. Oh, well. <laughs> Still, uh, uh, 10 seconds, Clement Freud, for I'll getting a break, it. starting now. If you get a motor car without a break, then it is absolutely essential to go to your nearest garage and purchase such an item, because the Ministry that deals with... Kenneth Williams. Deviation. Deviation. I'm sorry, hesitation. Hesitation, there, actually. Yeah, yes, I've got your yes, deviation yes. on the brain. We're I'm all really... with you, Kenneth. It's all right. Don't get rattled, because uh, there are only two seconds left for getting a break, starting now. Well, I had my nose bashed, and it was broken right across you. <laughs> yes, well, I that late Let's... spurt up the field from Kenneth Williams. Yes? Not quite. Uh, not quite, Kenneth. No. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> No, you're still two points behind Clement Freud, who's still in the lead, and Geraldine Jones is three or four points behind you. I'm always behind, every week. But I'm you're not <laughs> right behind. Always before they said you had a little behind. Yes. <laughs> Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. The things in my wallet. 
We'll have no penalties this time. The things in my wallet, Kenneth, for just a minute, starting now. The things in my wallet. I will have to speak of, I'm afraid, in the past tense, because I lost my wallet and it had <laughs> such dreadful repercussions that I did not purchase another. When I went to the police station, they said, what was the wallet like? I said, it was Morocco leather, and the policeman said, how do you spell Morocco? And I didn't know myself. But in that was all my insurance stuff, my identity card, and my old ration book. I used to keep it because I loved it as a souvenir. And a photograph of Maudie Fittleworth. Maudie, <laughs> Maudie Fittleworth, you'll all remember, fun with a Frankfurter. She was the top of the bill, and I adored Maudie. And I used to go round to her dressing room. Uh, after... Clement Freud, you challenged Three me. Maudies. Yes, 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 we had a bit too much of Maudie, I'm afraid. You couldn't have enough of her. I uh, know. <laughs> you speak for yourself, Kenneth, and... <laughs> we'll speak for the game. Ken uh, Clement Freud has a point. He has 23 seconds for... I said to about to say for Maudie Littleworth. <laughs> 23 seconds for the things in my wallet starting now. I have a number of pockets in my wallet, some of which are used for money and other for carrying cards and identity tags and credit slips. But ideally, the right-hand side of my wallet contains five-pound notes and the middle green one-pound notes with ten-shilling notes bringing up the rear. On the left-hand side, I have my identity card, which I've kept for reasons... Well, as Cameron Troy was speaking, as the buzzer went, he gains another point, and it's Geraldine's uh, uh, Jones's turn to begin. Uh, Geraldine, making an exit. I don't know whether you've ever done that, but uh, here's a good chance to talk about it for 60 seconds, starting now. The worst part about making an exit is that if you want it to be really spectacular, you have to accept that a lot of people must see it. And if you leave a lot of people in a room after you've gone, you're open to the awful searing doubts all the way home that the moment the door has slammed behind you, they all burst into malicious conversation about you and all the faux pas you've made during the evening. The most important rule, however, that slightly overcomes this... Uh, Kenneth Williams. Hesitation. Hesitation, yes, mm. yes. Kenneth, you have the subject of making an exit. 35 seconds, starting now. The thing to do, of course, is to wear a toga, because as you turn round, the great line of the garment swells and billows out, and you say, I'm going now, and out you go, and everyone gets the full effect. You can say, je suis Roman, you see, which means I am Roman, because they wore those great things that you could swell out and billow about with. Uh, oh, Geraldine Jones. Repetition of billowing and swelling. <laughs> <laughs> Repetition of quite a lot of things, I think. <laughs> Geraldine, you have the subject back. You have 15 seconds for making an exit starting now. The vital thing to remember is not to leave anything behind. Nothing spoils making an exit more than having to go back a little bit later and say, I left my umbrella or I left my handkerchief or my handbag. Uh, Clement Freud. Repetition. Too many alternatives. <laughs> oh... May I oh, answer? Uh, yes, Geraldine. Oh, I, I yes, I, I heard what the alternatives were, Clement. Uh, uh, Geraldine, would you like to justify, Ken? Well, I, I would say that an alternative was by definition not repetition. Oh, what? Aren't they clever, all of them? <laughs> Aren't they clever? And as the score is so close and you're uh, a little behind, Geraldine, I'm going to give you a point. <laughs> oh, and... give her a point. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, she wouldn't allow me my billows, would she? <laughs> It was I who didn't allow your billers. Oh, it wasn't Geraldine. Yes, quite right. <laughs> yeah, but three seconds left for Geraldine Jones on making an exit starting now. The best place, perhaps. Clement Freud, you challenge one. Hesitation. No, definitely not. Geraldine has another point. <laughs> and you have two seconds left for making an exit, Geraldine, starting now. On a stage, an exit is much easier to make because after. <laughs> Well, the sad thing about that last round is that if Geraldine had been challenged once or twice more, she might just have caught up the other two, because it so happens that that is the last round of this particular game, and it also turns out that Clement Freud and Kenneth Williams are equal, so they are this week's winners. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messeter and produced by David Hatch.